All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Jennifer Cook, director of the Africa program here at CSIS. I think we'll have people trickling in. Unfortunately, it's it's the UN the UN General Assembly and uh, Rosh Hashanah today, but I think uh, we will we'll have a good turnout at any rate. And we're also being webcast as we speak. Um, this is the fourth session of the CS. I'm not sure why this echo is happening. Um, is the volume, is it a volume issue? You're getting a bit of echo. Okay. Uh, this is the fourth session of the CSIS Nigeria Election Forum, uh, which uh, the CSIS Africa program has been hosting since January uh, of this year, uh, running, through, uh, running through next year, April of next year, through the election, uh, which is scheduled for February 2015. Uh, we're sponsored by the Ford Foundation, and we're very grateful um, for that support. The, the purpose of the forum is really to look at different dimensions of uh, Nigeria's forthcoming elections, uh, looking, looking at these elections in the context of, uh, uh, I, I really I wish we could, can we do anything about this noise? <laughs> Sorry, it's, uh, I feel like I'm echoing. So we're trying to look at these elections in the context of a changing political situation and a changing security uh, uh, situation as well. Um, to underscore for U.S. policymakers and a U.S. policy audience and really a more global audience how critically important these elections are um, for all that's happening in Nigeria in the security realm, um, these elections really do need to go right. It's happening at a time of huge political fluidity in Nigeria. Uh, with a, a coalition of opposition groups for, for that for the first time in Nigeria's history has a, a genuine chance of uh, really challenging the incumbent party. A lot of uh, crossing of aisles happening before the election. Uh, a lot of social fermentation in the country. A, a enormously young population uh, with uh, rising expectations, more connected to one another. Rising expectations, and I would say, uh, a deepening distrust of government, not necessarily this particular government, but kind of a cumulative frustration with their political leadership overall. It comes at a time of uh, economic uh, dynamism. Uh, some important ec economic reforms going on, I exciting things in, in the commercial realm, but also at the same time uh, deepening inequalities uh, across uh, the country. And then, of course, there is the security situation and a dire security situation in the northeast of the country uh, and the predations of Boko Haram, which have uh, really hit those regions very hard economically, politically, and, and socially as well in terms of delivery of services. And a big question about how, how credible and how, uh, can elections in the northeast be or how, how can they even take place? Um, elections are always tend to be uh, moments that can, can drive flashpoints. The question is, in this situation, do they d deepen divides or begin to bridge them? Um, I think good, credible elections are not going to fix any of these problems, but bad elections will make these problems very much worse and will really make kind of national solutions to these problems much more elusive. Uh, so we began in this forum in January looking at different dimensions of the elections and, and really bringing Nigerian voices here to, to tell that story. The first session with uh, INEC Chairman uh, Atahiru Jega, Chair of the Electoral Commission, looked at the overarching framework and some of the big challenges in the year ahead. We brought the political party leadership here to talk about their strategies in reaching voters, in mitigating the potential of violence. Uh, and in the last, in July, we held a session on uh, election security, um, looking at messaging to voters, messaging from party leaders, what this might mean in the Northeast, what are the flashpoints in the rest of the country. Um, one, of the, one of the themes that come, has come out in all of these sessions, I think from the very beginning, um, is, the, is the fact that responsibility for successful elections, very much as with security in Nigeria, does not fall on one institution alone. Uh, huge expectations of INEC, but this is not only INEC's job. Uh, the government has a role to play, 
the political party leadership has a role to play. The security forces do, yes, have a, a, a role to play. Civil society has a role to play. Uh, NGOs, and, and then particularly voters, <laughs> obviously have a role to play, probably the most uh, important but sometimes forgotten element of the election process. So today's session, we're really gonna focus on, on the voter um, and efforts that are being made to educate voters, to get them out to vote, uh, to keep them safe and secure, um, to help inform their choices, um, and, to, and to ensure that, they, that their vote counts. Um, before I introduce uh, Chris Fumunio, who's going to moderate the first panel, I just want to say it's, it's very easy to get gloomy about Nigeria uh, when you read the newspapers and the stories breaking out. Um, but I think, you know, having been in Nigeria in 2003, 2007, 2011, um, there, there are things that are changing, even if 2011 was not perfect. There are new technologies that are being used, new media, uh, there's really an increasingly broad and sophisticated uh, civil society um, that since, since, the, since 1999, it's been growing exponentially. There are big new constituencies for change. Um, there's institutional change, and the leadership of INEC, I think, showed, uh, showed some of that. Um, and there's a growing base of data and evidence uh, and lessons learned from previous elections that can be applied to, to new elections, and we're going to hear some of that in this first panel. Um, there are, uh, it's not a static picture in Nigeria, and, and there's a lot of good things uh, happening, even in, in the democratic deepening. And there's a lot of people who are very, working very hard to make that happen. Uh, NGOs, uh, the Youth Corps, INEC, and, and some of the people that we're going to um, hear from today uh, in the trenches, let's say. Um, so we're going to start today's session with a look back at 2011. Uh, our first panel is going to look at some of the analysis from that election, what, what lessons does it hold uh, for uh, 2015, um, and uh, we're going to also hear from our INEC representative, uh, Oluwale Uzi, about INEC strategies uh, going forward. And Chris Fumunio, who is Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute, is going to lead. We owe a huge debt to Chris and his team here at CSIS for advising us on, on this, on, on, on getting the right people here, on tackling the right issues, uh, on, on Nigeria and other things. I think all of you know Chris Fumunio, anyone who looks at Nigeria or democracy in West Africa knows Chris, um, uh, for his tremendous depth of knowledge, um, his balance of analysis, and I think if you've ever uh, been on an election observation mission with him, um, his sense of, of, of calm in the midst of what can be chaos. So Chris, I'm going to turn over to you and uh, hear from our panel. Um, so thanks very much for joining. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for those very kind words. And uh, you know, I, you almost made me blush, but if I blush, you wouldn't know. <laughs> I, I really want to thank uh, Jennifer and her team for the leadership uh, that they've shown uh, here at CSIS in keeping um, Nigeria on the forefront, on the front burner of everyone's interest here in Washington. Um, you know, I have been around the city for quite a while, and I really haven't quite seen this in the sense of um, an, an open platform uh, for people to come in way in advance of national elections and to talk about the various issues pertaining to uh, that country's elections. I think it says something to the importance and the significance that Nigeria represents uh, for Nigerians, first of all, but also for the Africa continent. And this is really the first time that we have an open platform uh, that has gone, uh, would be a year, in, that was set up a year in advance of the elections itself. And that is really allowed not just the people in Washington that are interested in issues Nigerian and African, but Nigerians themselves, Nigerian stakeholders to come to Washington and be able to interact with uh, people who are interested in being supportive of the electoral process in the country. Uh, so I really thank CSIS and, and Jennifer and your Africa team uh, for your leadership on this and for this uh, wonderful opportunity. As, we are, as uh, Jennifer said earlier, elections are really about people and voters. Uh, that's how it should be in every democracy, and Nigeria definitely is, is an emerging democracy and is working hard 
to strengthen its democratic credentials and institutions. It's about voters and how they take advantage of the opportunities uh, provided to them by the election administration body, and in this case, INEC. It's about voters and what they hear from the political contestants, political parties and candidates, and how that influences the way in which they make their choices. It's about voters in terms of citizen participation, which then allows um, us all to determine the credibility of the process and the legitimacy that ensures from that process uh, for the winners of the day. And so we thought that with this panel on engaging voters, uh, we would hear from two very distinguished panelists who have paid attention to the, um, the trends, the voting trends in Nigeria and the attitudes of Nigerian voters uh, towards the electoral process. I think part of the objective in uh, the part of the goal in setting up this uh, panel is so that all of us can begin to have a more critical analysis of voting patterns in Nigeria, that we're not overwhelmed by the sheer size of the country or the sheer size of the electorate or the fact that it's a, over 120,000 polling sites, but that we can take the time to do some scientific analysis of voting patterns that could invariably influence Nigerian politicians and candidates and political parties in, which, in, in the ways in which they approach the Nigerian voter. And the intent is that ultimately, uh, as civil society organizations go about their work, uh, that the approach to politics in Nigeria could differ a lot uh, from what we've seen in the past, and that voters and, and that parties and candidates can be more focused in crafting for voters uh, messages that will respond to issues of their immediate in, um, interest. And to do that, we have uh, here with us um, Mr. Oluwole Uzi, who is the Director of Voter Education, Pub uh, Publicity, Gender, and CSOs at INEC. Uh, Mr. Uzi is a practicing, practicing attorney. He was a practicing attorney for 15 years uh, prior to joining INEC in 19. Uh, 98. Um, so he was the special advisor to the very first pioneer chairman of INEC and has been with INEC ever since then. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in law from the University College of Wales in the UK um, and also an LLM uh, from the University of Benin. He's uh, an expert in constitutional law and uh, tort law. And before Mr. Uzi's intervention, I will hear from my uh, senior colleague at NDI, uh, Richard Klein, uh, who is the senior advisor for elections at the National Democratic Institute. Uh, Richard has been working on these issues for the past um, 18 years, uh, since joining NDI in 1996. And he's been very involved in helping citizen groups uh, around the world uh, enhance their capacity uh, to monitor elections, and more specifically, working on introducing statistical principles and new information technologies into the election monitoring process. Uh, Richard has personally supervised um, close to 2,000 2, parallel vote tabulation exercises around the world. In fact, he's uh, a world-renowned distinguished expert on PVTs. Um, and has taken particular interest in the Nigerian PVT. Uh, Richard holds um, a master's degree uh, from the London School of uh, Economics and Political Science, and also a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University. Um, and so we'll start with Richard, and after Richard's presentation, we'll take some questions pertaining to his presentation, and then we'll have uh, Mr. Uzi follow up uh, Thereafter. So, without much ado, uh, Richard, you have the floor. Um, so, uh, this is a little bit of an easier exercise than the last time I spoke a, a few years ago about elections data on Nigeria, uh, except for that time. Uh, Professor Michael Bratton, who many of you know, uh, was in the audience who was my professor. Uh, and so I have to say I was much more nervous uh, speaking then than, than I am today. 
uh, though I'm sorry that he is not here. He, we would have benefited from, from his contribution. Um, uh, also, I'm very happy that we have uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Uzi from uh, INEC. I'm just back from Nigeria, where we did a similar presentation for Professor Jaga uh, and other commissioners uh, from INEC. Uh, about this website and the information that is uh, available uh, to uh, all election stakeholders, including the, uh, uh, the Election Commission. Um, there are a few people in the audience who know me. Um, I'm a person who enjoys the sound of my own voice. Uh, initially, Jennifer told me that I would have four hours. Um, that has been somewhat shortened, which I am not happy about, but we will, we will do what we can. The idea here is really to try to give people an introduction to the wealth of information that is available. Um, this presentation should really be done by one of my Nigerian colleagues. Uh, actually, today in Abuja, uh, Lazarus Appear from the Transition Monitoring Group, TMG, was giving a similar presentation to civic activists in, in Abuja. Uh, unfortunately, Laz was not able to join us here in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Washington, and so I will do a woeful but uh, uh, an attempt to, to replace him. Um, because the data that you're going to see here isn't NDI's data. Um, we worked with a consortium of uh, Nigerian organizations um, to conduct, as Chris said, a parallel vote tabulation, or PVT. Um, what that means is uh, deploying carefully recruited trained uh, observers to a representative random sample of polling stations in every geopolitical zone, in every state, and in every LGA of Nigeria. This provides the highest quality data possible uh, on an electoral process that in the past that uh, is, uh, observation information had one of, or, of two uh, uh, weaknesses. Either one, it was anecdotal, right? Meaning that there was more information from some areas and less information from other areas. The sample was designed very carefully so that it would accurately represent every geopolitical zone, every state, and every LGA of the country. Thus, if an LGA has more polling units and more voters, it would have more reports in the sample, right? Um, uh, the, the second challenge is that that information is not necessarily available immediately, right? That all of this data was moved by coded, te uh, coded text message using ordinary mobile phones so that this information was available by about, we were finished collecting information somewhere around six or seven in the morning the day after the election to be able to immediately provide the people of Nigeria, most importantly, but also INEC and political contestants, right, with independent nonpartisan information about the election that was truly representative. It was not, neither anecdotal nor skewed in favor of a particular area of the, of the country. So what has been done here in Nigeria by TMG, one of the consortium partners, and who will conduct a similar exercise for 2015, is to take all of that data for the first time ever, not the first time in Nigeria, not the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I work most of the time, and not the first, it is the first time in the world that any group has made this kind of information available that reflecting uh, uh, the desire for greater openness and transparency, that we live in a world where we can share data as never before, right? And that we want to see ways of different people using data in different ways and bringing different data sets together, right? When we have information, when we have empirical evidence, we make better decisions, right? And so this information is being provided to all stakeholders right, to try to help them as we move towards 2015 so that they can conduct better programs based not on what maybe elites think the election, uh, how the election was conducted, but based on actual data on, on the election. Of course, 2015 won't be the same as 2011. Jennifer pointed out some of the challenges that are, are new or exacerbated since then, but it still provides an important uh, set of lessons for the 2015 elections. In addition, something that has always been important on Nigeria is understanding the trajectory of the country, right? 
that one of the important things in questions in 2011 was each election had been worse than the one before, right? And I think there is certainly the, the consortium found that 2011 changed that trajectory. But to be honest, we had hard data on 2011, but to compare that to what? We compared that to anecdotal data about 20, 2007. That the data that I'll be presenting also provides us with a very important baseline to, in a much less subjective way, assess the quality of the 2015 elections. The truth is, uh, there was a delegation from INEC that came earlier this year. We were discussing the voter registration process. I remember in 2010 being in Nigeria for voter registration. A very astute lawyer was on national television saying that if a single Nigerian, an eligible Nigerian is not registered, they should do the exercise over. That is often the bar in Nigeria that people are being held to. I would argue that that is an unfair bar, right? That instead, all elections have challenges. I come from the great state of Illinois. In the great state of Illinois, dead people vote in every election. In the great state of Illinois, we currently have four of our five previous governors in jail. And I ex fully expect that we will go to five for five when uh, Governor Quinn uh, is out of office, right? So the question here isn't about getting a perfect election. The question here is, are we doing better? Are we learning from the mistakes that we made from the past? Are we learning from things that happened in the past so that we can do a better job so that ultimately, right, that the vast, vast majority of Nigerians have a credible opportunity to express their political preference and that we can all have confidence that those who are elected into office are the actual choice of the Nigerian people. Right? An important step forward was taken in 2011 to, to, to move Nigeria in that direct, direction, but that goal that was, is clearly, that is an unfinished process, and as Jennifer said, there are new challenges. I may have already used my entire 15 minutes. So, so this website, um, the first thing that it, it, it is broken up into a number of stories. There are lessons that TMG has that they think are the most salient for people uh, looking at Nigeria, Nigeria watchers such as yourself. So the first story is that historically in Nigeria there has been a big question about can we trust the results? Are the results as announced by INEC, act, do they accurately reflect the ballots cast at polling stations? That was certainly a huge question in the 98-99 elections, right? And it has continued to plague Nigerian elections. When we did an assessment uh, in 2010, over and over again, people said to us, right, that polling stations do not open, and yet there are results for those polling units, and that the results that are being announced in uh, Abuja have no correlation with our experience in our local area. So because observers go to a representative random sample of polling units, you can simply add together the results from, the, from uh, the sampled polling units and see do those match with the official results. So what you see here is there are a lot of parties in Nigeria. There are fewer parties today, but there are a lot of parties in Nigeria. We're just highlighting four that received a significant number of votes. The green lines uh, or the darker lines for the colored blind people here, Chris Doton is not here, so we're fine. The green lines or the darker lines, the lower lines, those are the official figures from INEC, right? The light gray lines are the PVT estimates. Those are numbers that uh, the consortium had by 7 a.m. the morning after the election, long before INEC announced any results, right? They waited to see what INEC's numbers would be, right? that if those numbers had disagreed, they would be able to demonstrate that in fact the results had been manipulated, right? And not to say that because, oh, we didn't like the outcome of the election, but to actually have data to back this up, right? No one likes to lose, right? Liverpool supporters in this room are not happy about last season in the English Premiership, right? I'm sorry, I spend more time outside of the US, so. Uh, I'm sure there's some U.S. football equivalent that someone could come up with. The, uh, I think Broncos. So anyway, that, um, right, that uh, right, all the time, one of the banes in Africa writ large is that losers don't accept the outcomes of the election, not because 
they were cheated, but because they lost, right? And so we, uh, what uh, the consortium was able to do was provide right, scientific data for people to be able to evaluate whether the results as announced by INEC were accurate. As you can see, in each case, the official results fell within the margin of error. Because we only went to 1,500 polling units, we're not able to produce an exact number, but we can produce a number with a margin of error that says that the, exact, that the official numbers must fall within that margin. If they don't, then something has been manipulated. The PVT, though, is about much more than just results. It is also about the quality of the process. How on earth do we know if we trust that the results as announced at a polling unit are the, uh, the, the product of a good process, right? Um, in uh, 2003, I certainly saw, right, people standing outside of polling units, right, giving out cards, uh, voter cards to people to go and vote, and then they would return the card and they would be given some Naira, right? That is not how we want people to be voting, right? So what was the quality of the process, right? What the consortium found is that the process in 2011 was much better than anecdotal evidence from 2007. Oops, I don't know what's going on. So, uh, however, it was not a perfect process. Better than the state of Illinois, but still not a, a perfect process. So one of the things that has been a, a topic of some discussion and TMG felt was very important is logistics, right? Can you simply open up uh, polling units. Can you get the, uh, the materials there? This had been a huge issue in 2007, right, when many polling units simply never opened. So what they found was in tw tw 2011 that at 99% of polling units, they did in fact open. There was some small number that did not, and those people would have been disenfranchised, right? But in fact, that was a marked improvement from the anecdotal evidence from 2007. However, that uh, uh, not all the polling stations, we want to give people an equal opportunity to participate in the process. When some polling stations open earlier and other polling stations open later, that in fact dis uh, disadvantages some people, right? So what they found was by 9 a.m., which is not when they were supposed to be open, they were supposed to be uh, open well before 9 a.m., but it, by 9 a.m., 76% were open. But that, in fact, pattern was not even across the entire country. And so INEC, right, should not be working equally across the whole country to address that concern. What we see is, right, opening times were much better across the north and in the southwest, but were a challenge in south-south and southeast, right? And so the question for INEC should be, how do they better, most efficiently use their resources to try to address these issues? Right? That when we met with uh, Professor Jaga several weeks ago, right, we had a discussion. To be honest, for TMG, much easier to observe a, a state election, just like much easier for INEC to do a state, conduct a state election. And so while Anambra uh, at the end of last year had logistical challenges, both Ekati and Ocean have gone much better. But as Professor Jaga acknowledged, national elections are much more challenging, right? This, the second map, uh, um, oops. Right, highlights the individual LGAs that had the greatest problems, right? And so the idea is to provide people, right, in this case INEC, with information that helps them to improve the performance of 2015. Because I wasn't given my full four hours, I'm not going to go through every single image. This is a public website, and I hope people will visit it afterwards. Another issue that TMG felt was very important was Nigeria had adopted a new voting system, a unique system, a system that, in fact, civil society, including TMG, had advocated for quite for, uh, forcefully. Right? The question is, when you adopt a new system, one, is that system really adopted? And two, are there unintended consequences? So in looking at the system, they had moved from an individual process, which the uh, slide on the left tries to show, to essentially what is a group process. 
Before, individuals came and they did the entire process and then left. Now, individuals come and they do part of the process, but they have to wait till everyone has done that part of the process before you can move on to the next part of the process. This is not, hello. Yeah, that's, this is not the most uh, sensitive mouse. Sorry. Chris, could you type in TMG towards 2015? Right, so uh, while the site is coming up, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, if you just scroll down, or I can get it. Uh, you can just type in it. <laughs> this is not counting against my 15 minutes, that's all I'm saying. So, so did the new system, was it carried out the way that people thought that it would be carried out? Have we lost the internet now? So there were these two systems, and what we found was that 29% of polling units, people left after being accredited. They aren't legally obligated to stay there, but the whole system was designed to prevent double voting. The way that that works best is if people don't leave, right? That uh, uh, this, is not this is not illegal. It doesn't mean they went and double voted, but it certainly causes suspicion. In addition, people did not leave. This is more a, a anecdotal evidence, something I don't like to use. We'll try to get better data in 2015. Right? But different groups were more likely to leave than other groups, right? So anecdotal evidence suggests that it is the elderly and women with children who are most likely to leave. We will come back to that point. At, uh, uh, at the same time, at, so that is a voter education issue, right? That is an issue for civil society about the importance of staying at the polling unit. We'll return to that. At the same time, at 16% of polling units, people were accredited after uh, accreditation closed, so during the voting process. No one was supposed to be accredited to vote, right? No one was supposed to be allowed to vote unless they had shown up in the morning. This is both an INEC and a civil society issue because before you could show up at any time during the day and be allowed to vote. So some of the people who arrived in the afternoon to vote may have been perfectly eligible voters who had not voted anywhere else, but simply didn't realize that if you don't show up by noon, you're not gonna be able to vote. At the same time, right, there was not complete compliance on INEX part with the new procedures, right? Maybe people felt bad. Oh, these people have arrived. They don't appear to have voted anywhere else. They don't have any ink on their fingers. But again, all of this leads to suspicion, right? And if there's anything Nigeria is in short supply of, it is trust, right? We want to eliminate as many things that give people, right, a reason to complain about the elections. Finally, uh, so the website provides some information. These, again, were not homogenous, right? We can look and see. So people leaving was most common in Lagos. The red line is polling unit, right? The uh, percentage of polling units where most or all voters left. And that problem was most common in Lagos, also very frequent in Ocean uh, and places like that. At the same time, accreditation during voting most common in Anambra, Enugu, uh, Aboni, and, and such states. Another unintended consequence, though, that we saw in Anambra was that, and this is everything else you're seeing in this website, is data from uh, citizen observers, right? Carefully recruited, right, and trained observers, carefully selected and deployed to a random sample of polling units. But this number, which was verified by the observers, but is actually an INEX statistic, is that there were 22,277 people who went to the polling stations in the morning in Anambra, were accredited to vote, then left for some reason, and never came back, and hence never voted. 5% of people in Anambra, right, 5.2% of all the voters who went out left and never came back to cast their vote, right? That if we look then, it is not people, and Jennifer did a nice job of this in her introduction, 
we tend to put all of the blame and none of the credit on the election management body, in this case, INEC. Right? But elections have multiple stakeholders. The success of an election is based on lots of uh, the actions of lots of, uh, of stakeholders. One of the most important is obviously the political parties. Political parties play many roles in the election. We looked at one narrow piece, which is their presence at, uh, at polling units. Right? They are there to defend the interests of their parties. Right? But also, critically, if parties are going to complain about the results through legal mechanisms, through the official channels, the only way they can do that is if they have information about what took place at the polling units. If they don't have that data, then the only mechanism they are left with is the streets and the kind of violence that we sadly saw after the presidential election. So in looking at the results, Right? What we found was that 93% of polling units, the results were posted for everyone to see. At 87%, right, uh, the, the numbers added up accurately. Beyond the scope of this is there is still some work on maths to be done in Nigeria. Um, but this is much, much, much better than in Malawi. Malawi's recent election didn't make 50% of the results that added together properly. But, and at 96% of all polling, at polling units, every party agent who was there agreed that the result was an accurate reflection of what transpired at that polling unit, right? So what, what is being said is when it left the polling unit, we trust that number. The PVT says, ah, but the number that was announced in Abuja matches. So we should trust the results. But there is a challenge because what this map is showing is polling units that had only one party present. The whole concept, the whole idea, is that you are going to have different parties represented, each representing their own interest, none of whom presumably is noble, but that all of them cancel each other out. And to be honest, once you get to two parties, you're okay. What we find is, and that's why this is percentage of polling units with only one party agent present. And so what you see is across the north and southwest that essentially at all of the polling units multiple parties were represented. But in south, south, and southeast again, you had large numbers of polling units with only a single party present. That party being PDP. Right? If we then look, so right, so if parties are going to cry foul, or if parties are going to use legal means to question the results of an election, they have to have representation at, uh, at, at polling units. We saw a very similar pattern, to be honest, at the recent elections in Ekati. PDP had polling agents everywhere. APC, the governor may be, a former, now to former governor, may be a good technocrat, but he was not a good organizer, right? There were lots of polling units. APC had a, a polling agents at only about a third of, of uh, polling units. Um, a worrying trend from Ekati was Accord Party. Accord Party was beaten by spoiled ballots. They had no support. Accord, though, somehow managed to have a party agent at every single polling station in the sample, right? That is extremely suspicious about how they were able to have the, organ the organization and the resources to be able to do that when APC could not. Lastly, the last story from TMG is about turnout. Nigeria, if we put 2011, the turnout figures are somewhat similar to past elections in Nigeria, except for I would say that all those other numbers are, are highly suspect, right? That this is the first time we've had numbers that in any way we could trust. But when we look at Nigeria compared to the African continent, it is clearly underperforming in terms of turnout, right? that parties are not engaging citizens, that they are not providing citizens right with an incentive to participate in the election. I think this also goes back to, to be honest, a very good initiative by INEC about increasing the number of polling units right, to decrease the distance that people have to travel to get to, to polling stations. However, if we look at that turnout, 
by geopolitical zone, we see a ver uh, different patterns. This is in fact unusual, right? Party support tends to be heterogeneous, meaning that one part of a country, one party does well, and another part of the country, a different party does well. That is very common. But turnout tends to be relatively homogenous. That's because each party does an equally good job of getting its supporters out, right? What you have here is you have a lesson for political parties, you also have some concern about the, the, the lack of polling agents and the, the way the election process was administered. So in Southwest, what you find is very low turnout. And I would argue that that is due to uh, two related factors. One is that Lagos did not have a competitive gubernatorial election. No one thought Fasciola would lose the Lagos election. He didn't do very much to get people out. People didn't worry that much. It was a foregone conclusion, and Lagos has a, a not insubstantial population. Um, at the same time, right, to be honest, neither campaign, neither campaign did much to reach out to the Yoruba community, right? Nobody was trying to talk to the Amala eaters, right? And so, right, they didn't run good campaigns. At the same time, in South South and Southeast, we see a heightened turnout a heightened turnout exactly where, right, only one party had representation at polling units, right, making us concerned about the, uh, about the degree to which the procedures were followed, right, to prevent double voting. When we look at, this provides the percent of LGAs with turnout within a specified range. So right now it's showing you that Southwest had a huge number of polling units where turnout was between zero and 25%. Very low turnout, a turnout that we should be very concerned about. Across a little bit in South-South, but not very much anywhere else. But very alarmingly, these are polling units that had turnout between, right, 91 and 100%, a very suspiciously high turnout. And again, we see that being dominated in South-South and Southeast. Those are the lessons, I'm sure I'm well over, but I, I'm coming to a close. Those are the lessons that the TMG, those are the lessons that TMG has, but the website is really designed for anyone to use. Those are what TMG thought was most important. But all the data that TMG collected right, from its observers are available for anyone to use on the website. So explore the data by issue allows anyone to come and look at, these are all the questions from the checklist, right, that observers provided data on. So information is provided about various parts of the voter accreditation process, the voting process, the counting process, and the results. So if we wanted to look at, say, CPC vote share by the nation, this shows you a not very interesting map by geopolitical zone. But becoming much more interesting is when we look at it by LGA. To be honest, if, right, if you are in the United States or any longer established democracy, the first thing that you do when you start a campaign is you look at a map like this. You look at a map like this to understand right, where your support is, where, right, you are most likely to get your votes, right? Organizations like NDI, IRI, and others spend a lot of time trying to help political parties around the world build the skills to play by the rules of the democratic game. One of the challenges with that previously in Nigeria is they didn't actually have the information that you would need to be able to use those skills, right? That what would happen in the United States is if you lose an election, right, you, uh, or you win an election, right, you're gonna go out and get very drunk that night, right, one group very happy and the other group very sad. But either group is gonna then take a few days off and relax, and whether you won or lost, you're gonna start immediately looking at these maps to try to figure out what is your strategy, right, because over and over again, what, right, African politicians try to do is win 100% of the vote, which is a complete waste of anyone's time. Right? What you want to do is win 50% plus one. That means developing a strategy of how you get to that number. Right? And without this kind of data, 
right, to be able to say and look at a particular place and understand what kind of vote you got in that area. Where should you be concentrating your, your efforts? It is true that all over Africa that opposition parties may have fewer resources than ruling parties. But the truth is they don't, the few resources they have, they don't use efficiently, right? What this website does is provides information to people so that they can use that information effectively. Finally, Nigeria is an enormous country, right? Most states in Nigeria have more polling units than most other countries in Africa, right? that it is sort of absurd the work that TMG and others do of conducting activities across all of Nigeria. My girlfriend works on uh, clinical trials on antiretroviral drugs in Nigeria, right? They are funded by USAID, and USAID says your organization has the capacity to work in two states, not 36 states plus the FCT, because Nigeria is enormous, right? Most of the organizations that make up TNG, but lots of civic organizations, are not working across all of Nigeria. They're working in a particular one or two states, or maybe even just in a particular LGA. And so what the site also does is it provides people with a snapshot to be able to see what did the election look like in my particular area. So if you wanted to, I'm an Enugu man because that's where Beth does most of her work, and so I always find myself uh, in Enugu. Right? And so I can then look at right, the coal capital, and I can look at this is the profile of Anugu. It's all the data from Anugu. It is also broken down by LGA, the various LGAs of Anugu, so that people can right, design programs and interventions that are specifically targeted to that particular area. I am sure I am well over, and I really want to hear from my colleague from, uh, from uh, INEC. And so with that, I will close and uh, take some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Richard. And if you don't mind, I'll ask you to stand right yeah. there, because I anticipate that there may be some questions that will yes. prompt no, you to yep. go to specific slides. I appreciate how you used your time and didn't go through the entire exercise. Uh, we thought that because Richard's presentation is very specific and has a lot of new data, and we know that for the past um, three years, there's been a lot of interest, both in Nigeria and here, um, on having access to data on the 2011 elections. We thought we'd take specific questions for Richard before we go to our next panelist. So I'd like to take two or three questions with regards to Richard's uh, presentation. And please, uh, you know, stand up, introduce yourself, and then pose your question, make it brief and direct so we can get a direct response as well. Yep, the lady at the back, yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Amaka and I'm currently a lawyer in town. Um, I'm just curious about, this is fascinating and awesome, thank you for doing it. Uh, I'm curious about how you intend to go about collecting similar data for 2015, given the in insecurity in the Northeast. Are you planning to deploy citizen observers as well in as many places? Thank you. Thank you, Amaka. Any other question? Okay, Richard, why don't you take that? Sure. So, no, as I said, TMG plans on replicating uh, this exercise for 2015, that uh, certainly for international observers, there are going to be real challenges, right, in deploying across Nigeria. To be honest, already, you know, for the 2011 and previous elections, to be honest, there were huge swaths of the country that international observers simply did not go to because of security concerns. On the other hand, citizen observers uh, face different challenges. Right? And so TMG is made up of a collection of, uh, of uh, more than 300 civic organizations drawn from all the states of Nigeria. They recently had their national quick count meeting to launch uh, the, the exercise for 2015 that brought people from all, 148 people from all 36 states plus the FCT, right, to discuss the project refine the plans and to send people out to start the process of recruitment because you have to recruit people who are truly independent, 
who we have time to sufficiently train, and critically, that are right from that community. Because people are from that community, in country after country, because this methodology was first used, to be honest, in the Philippines in 1986, that when people are recruited directly from that community, they have the best understanding of the security concerns there, right, and are able to operate. What is a challenge is when you try to have observers come from one LGA into another LGA, right? Indigens are a very important concept in, uh, in Nigeria. And so the strategy for 2015, as was the case in 2011, is to be recruiting people through local NGO networks in all 37 states and, and the FCT, recognizing the security challenges, not just to be honest in the north, there remain security challenges in the Niger Delta, right? It doesn't seem to get a lot of attention these days, but it remains a very challenging part of the world to operate, and Chris doesn't publicly let people know that I go to that part of the world, that, um, that, uh, that uh, those are, there, there are real challenges. That is why, right, that uh, they started that process now, as soon as possible, right, so that you are able to, re to recruit people, right? That from a methodological standpoint, that if, the, if there is no election held in those states, that is a huge political issue. That is a potato I will leave for uh, my colleague from INEC. Um, but certainly, right, from a, from a PVT perspective, uh, TMG uh, has a strategy for deploying local people, right, in wherever the elections are conducted. And I think that the, they will be successful. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. I think you've uh, provided us a, a very good segue um, into our, the second part of our panel, um, which would allow us to hear from uh, Mr. Uzi, who is the Director of Voter Education at INEC. Thank you very much. I, my work really has, has cut out for me, but uh, I've been assisted in so many ways by uh, Jennifer's opening remarks and also by the presentation of uh, Richard. There isn't much really for me to Hard. But I've been called here to speak for a few minutes, so I think I'll just quickly run through uh, some of the things we've been trying to do with INEC to ensure that there's an all-inclusive participation in the, in, in the process and to identify a couple of challenges which um, have hampered our work in that uh, uh, regard. I listened very carefully. I was privileged to have seen just shortly before now parts of the uh, presentation. And yes, accreditation is a major issue. It's a new issue. It's, um, I think that was the second time actually we're doing it in Nigeria. I think in uh, 1993, we did experiment with that. Um, but a lot of people did not think it would work. Where, whereas everybody was determined to ensure that it's a better process and to ensure multiple, registry, multiple voting, which was a serious challenge in the past, did not reoccur. Uh, many thought that this issue of getting people accredited, letting them wait there for, wait there for three, four, five hours will just not work. I think it worked much better than we actually um, expected because a lot of people uh, predicted that it will cause confusion. But fortunately, in 2011, there wasn't all that much confusion. Admittedly, quite a number of people who uh, got accredited left the station because they felt they were, quote unquote, probably too busy. But if you look at it, and I think Richard mentioned it, a lot of the elderly people left, and you don't really expect them to. A lot of uh, voting points are in public places, open places. There are no sitting arrangements. You know, cannot do anything much about that. Even where you do in enclosed places like schools, like maternities and public health uh, institutions, they are not exactly ideal for somebody waiting for two, three, four hours. So many people felt, is it wrong for me to go back and attend to other issues and then come back here. And certainly you cannot stop people from doing that. If you did, participation would not be as, 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 as high. And many even complained, why can't I just, just get a credit and vote straight away and go about my business? A lot of people complained about that, but fortunately the vast majority of people accepted uh, uh, that. A lot of women especially 
did not want to wait. Look, we have household chores. We have lots of things to attend to. The farmers, people, and uh, Nigeria is a largely an agrarian society. They felt that, look, this is election. The man I'm voting for has his job, and this will not affect him. But this will impact negatively on the work that I do. So why should I wait? And there's this disconnect that, yes, they need my votes now. But the minute they get there, there's no accountability. He's going to do what he wants to do anyway. So let me still not sacrifice too much. By coming out to vote, I feel I'm making a lot of sacrifices already. I don't see why I should go out and stay there for several hours and let other things suffer. The logistics issue are there. They're still there. But um, I think we're going in the right direction with the uh, successes attained in both uh, Akiti and Oshun. Admittedly, as you quite rightly uh, observed, the challenges of a national election are much, much more than a state election. But at least we have a pro forma. We have something to look up to. And um, it's our determination to ensure that uh, we get as high as we did in Oshun, a nationwide election. And Oshun, Oshun, I think it was 97% actually of this polling is opened at, before 8 o'clock or by 8 o'clock. There were one or two issues, um, one specifically near Ife was an issue of um, problems between the electoral officer and the security agencies. The electoral officer had agreed with the, with the parties and other uh, CSOs that look, rather than distribute the materials, we have non-sensitive and sensitive materials. It's a terminology that is, I think, almost peculiar to Nigeria. Uh, the, the sensitive materials are the balloting instruments and result sheets. Whereas most places, all materials go at the same time. In Nigeria, we ensure that they don't. The non-sensitive to, uh, to address the logistic challenges goes much earlier than the, secu the security or the secure ones that they come on the eve of the election. But because of the miscommunication between uh, the electoral officer and the security agents, one or two stations within a particular ward did not start on time in Oshun. But we're addressing that, admittedly, with a complex country, as you said, like Nigeria, and the challenges, the logistics challenges of the roads, accessibility. Again, another phrase that's that is common, common in Nigeria that's not so common areas is, is, is the issue of uh, what we call uh, the areas that are so inaccessible. Admittedly, places like India also have inaccessible areas, but they still manage to do things as and when expected. But the, the, the difficult terrain, and this is not peculiar to any particular area, it's, it's, it's more pronounced in the south-south area where they have um, riverine communities. And with your speedboat, it takes sometimes three, sometimes four hours to get from the local government uh, headquarters to another, to other communities within the same locality and from where results and, uh, will be tabulated. It can take three to four hours by speedboat all else being equal. And in the far north, you do have uh, desertification and widely dispersed communities. Admitted, a polling unit can take, up to, it can take you three to four hours, not necessarily because of the geographical distance per se, but because of the difficulty, the difficult terrains. In the northeast, in Adamawa, you have a, a mountain range near the Cameroonian border. And there are some communities there that takes better part of three, four hours, and use all means of communication to go to, 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 to get up there. You use cars, you use uh, motorbikes, and you use animals to actually transport materials and personnel up to these settlements because they need to be uh, serviced. We we'll certainly will look into that. Adamawa uh, governorship election will present its own unique challenges, and if we can do as well as we did in Oshun and Ekiti with the Adamawa, I think then there's a great hope something to look forward to for the general uh, elections. We have challenges as well as you observed with party agents. The law says that the party agents should, the parties should submit a list of the party agents seven days to the election. But in most cases, they just don't do this. The idea is that INEC has enough time to print specific identity, identity cards for these agents. In the past, we allowed them to use their party uh, cards. But we discovered that very often the parties exchange cards. So you have a PDP man who will be carrying an APC card or vice versa and um, he says, but I am this agent, look at my card. 
So we saw this as a challenge. How do we address this? Let us authenticate these cards. Let us print our own cards for these agents. Let them be in a card. Let them not bear the party logo. All they have to do is bear the name of the, of the, part, of the party and the name of the person who's accredited for that polling unit. But invariably, they don't bring these names on time. And when they don't do that, you cannot uh, customize cards for them for particular units as well or collection centers. You tell them it's for their own good, it's for their own benefits. Or sometimes they also come and they give you a list. Two days later, they change that list. Ah, what happened? Ah, we think uh, some names on that list have been compromised and uh, we don't trust these people again. It's a very serious challenge. So, but we've already printed these cards. What do we do? And there's not enough time for us to print new cards for these people. But I reject that. I quickly go to the office and write a letter. Say, look, the list previously submitted is no longer valid. Please do not use that list. That list does not emanate, no longer emanates from us. They are not our agents. And you've trained the, 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 the young uh, youth corpus who uh, act as election personnel to ensure that only those with genuine inner cards are accredited to observe in the, uh, to, to act as party agents in those particular units. So these are some of the practical challenges that we have. Even though they know that it's for their own good, uh, you still have such uh, 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 challenges. A lot has changed since 2011 because there were several reform, uh, I think Professor Jigai in January, where he was here, outlined a lot of the reforms that have been undertaken. Part of it is that, is that it affects my department. Previously, in 2011, you had a department for voter education, separate and distinct from the department for publicity, and you had a CSO desk that dealt with CSO issues. So there are disparate uh, groups within the commission, and of course we have internal communication issues within the com commission, but all doing overlapping or basically the same uh, thing. That is why these were fused into the department for voter education, publicity, CSO liaison, and gender. And it is also part of the desire to ensure all these historically disadvantaged groups partake, not just as voters. We've, we've done a lot in terms of, uh, with the help of civil society, in terms of uh, getting them to come out to register. But we're engaging the political parties as well. It's not enough that they should be vote, just, just voters. Representations of disadvantaged groups, especially people living with disabilities, with women, it's declining. Participation in terms of elective and appointive, elective, I think the government hasn't done too badly with appointive offices, at least in the federal level. But with elective positions, it's a totally different ballgame. For whatever reasons, those historical, those cultural, those boundaries are still there. And we realize that they must come down. How soon this is done is a different uh, thing entirely. But we've tried to con continue to engage the political parties. And to be fair, they, they all pay lip service to that. In each and every constitution that they have with, registered with INEC, they, 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 they tell you how important it is to them to ensure women especially and the youths are uh, engaged. They guarantee rights, they, 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 they are policies, they are manifestos, they are objectives are such that they are all inclusive. But in practice, there's a, there's a disconnect there. And there actually isn't much legally that we can do but continue to engage them. And I think a lot of civil societies in Nigeria are working in this direction, and we've recorded uh, some levels of success in terms of listening, in terms of uh, extracting commitments. In another couple of months, the primaries and the congresses will commence. We'll see how successful we have been in this uh, regard, but not too many people are optimistic. They, they still believe that there's a lot of uh, lip service to this. Now we have... Um, there's a communication policy that's just been adopted by the, by the commission, and that is the fulcrum of our engagement with uh, the owners of the process. We very much realize and appreciate that the electorate, the voters, are actually the owners of the process. We are caretakers at best. We're not the owners. And other stakeholders are equally important, but the voters must be fully and well informed and engaged in the whole uh, process. But in getting to them, we realize that INEC alone cannot do this. Very often, when we engage our other stakeholders, they say, but that is your responsibility. And coincidentally, until 2006, with the reforms of 2006, voter education was not part of the primary responsibilities of INEC. It never was there. It was the 2006 re reform which brought us in. And again, it's entrenched in uh, 2010 that voter education and promoting sound democratic practices are part of the responsibilities and functions of the commission. Most of the functions of the Constitution are spelled out in the Constitution. 
But voter education is not there. It was an act of the National Assembly, the Electoral Act, that actually introduced voter education. So we tell them, look, yes, it is our responsibility, but it's also the responsibility of other agencies, it's the responsibility of all other stakeholders. The, 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 the political parties find it strange. It's, it's almost an alien concept to them that they have to do voter education. But I say, but you must do so. You must mobilize your supporters. You must get them to eschew all those vows, vices like uh, malpractices and violence. Over and above that, you must ensure they vote and they vote correctly. But what they are not too happy and what they don't do is in terms of getting policy dialogues with, 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 with their supporters. What do you stand for? What does your manifesto stand for? Very often when we go for, when we, we uh, oblige to observe, uh, to monitor campaigns, what you do see is that they bring some popular artists. They come and play music. That attracts a large crowd. And then if it's a party that the umbrella is a symbol, you see everybody carrying an umbrella. If it's a party where the broom is a symbol, everybody's with a broom. It's not so much what they talk about, what they stand for that, 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 that matters so much to them. It's the fact that they brought a very popular, and they go for the most popular and in tune musicians. And anything that is free is attractive for, for us. So it's not very often to go and watch uh, most of these musicians cost you a month, your monthly salary just to go and watch them for two hours. But there you are, seeing them for free, them, them coming to you. It happened in Australia, it happened in Ekiti. Despite the successes of pulling their issues in, a, in, in the campaigns, left very much to be uh, desired. And we try to tell them, when you're trying to tell them, oh, look, it's true violence, don't take money from these people. I have instances where, when I engage some groups, we say, look, look at it this way. We're in a commun communal setting. I have some young couples in their 20s conducting the election. I have unarmed security men there. There's somebody in the clear vicinity of everybody dishing out money. It says, go and vote, come collect your money. Before, you could do that, and on trust, they'll give you money. But very often, some people now found that they collected money, but their parties lost in some of those polling stations. So what did they do? They said, now, OK, fine. You have to show us. You go to some places, and everybody votes. Voting is secret. Say, yeah, but it's my ballot. I can choose whether I want it to be secret or I want it not to be. It's my option. The option is mine. Yes, the law guarantees secret balloting, secret voting, but I have decided to waive that right, and it shows it to everybody. The next person comes and does exactly the same thing. So by the time the third, fourth person, even if I now want to come and uh, vote secretly, there's a challenge for me. It happened in a couple, one or two places. There's now a serious challenge to me. That, then why are you hiding your vote? It's supposed to be an open thing, and this communal thing is also uh, very strong in some areas. The community comes and decides, Look, this is our son. We are going to vote for this particular person or that person. There isn't much we can do about that. Even if you try to say, look, policeman, arrest that man distributing money. This man is hungry. There's poverty or pervasive in the land. They would rather take the money and do That's why, for example, this discussion on use of cell phones, take a photograph of your vote. Yes, you take your photograph. Very often, we think that the person wants to go back. They go to around the corner and show them that, look, truly, I voted for X party or Y party and collect some money. That's why we were not too enthused about the whole idea. But I, I'm told my time is up, so pardon me. Um, one or two other things to talk about. But let me just say that we have tried to engage uh, other government agencies. We've set up an interagency committee on uh, voter education and publicity, which will uh, harness all government resources. You have agencies like the Ministry of Information. You have agencies like the uh, National Orientation Agency, whose jobs are it is to mobilize people, to orient people, and, and stuff like that. So we're trying to we're working in close partnership with them. The development partners have been very helpful. They've been uh, uh, bankrolling a lot of our activities, and also the the, the 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 Nigerian Guild of Editors and Nigerian Union of Journalists are also members of that of that uh, body. They've come in very, very uh, useful, and I think it's a pointer to how good we can work together. And of course, there are continuous, continued CSO engagements. But having said that, there are two things I take from this particular trip. Uh, Richard did say that I think it's uh, Illinois, the gov four out of the last five governors have gone to jail. Interesting anecdote. Uh, in Nigeria, only one has gone to jail out of more than 70 since 1998. And he didn't go to jail in Nigeria. He was convicted in England. So that's something I'm thinking. Now, but I read an article, I think it's F. Judge Wills, in the syndicated writer in the, Atl in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution of Sunday. And there's an interesting proposition coming out of California. And um, I never did think about it, but I'm taking that home with me. And he said that, look, there's this crazy thing. He thought it was crazy anyway, but uh, 
there's this idea coming out of California, Los Angeles. I think the last election there was 23% voter turnout, and it says, this is ridiculous. How do we get voters out? So I thought that was only a uh, challenge peculiar to Nigeria. But he said, no, maybe they should start a balloting system, uh, a kind of pools, a kind of system where there should be some financial incentives to get voters coming out. So they will do a lottery. And this is seriously being discussed. I don't know how far it's correct. I read it there in the, in the, in the Constitution Journal of Atlanta that they're thinking seriously about it in Los Angeles of, of giving good incentives. Well, we already have the incentives of giving money, but not state money, not official money. But also, maybe this lottery system, if you come out and vote and prove that you're voting, maybe you have a chance of winning some money or some pecuniary thing of credit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uzi. And um, we, we're really running out of time, but I think if one or two people have burning questions from Mr. Uzi, we can take them in, uh, both questions at once, and then give him an opportunity to uh, respond. This gentleman right here. Just one second, I'm on the microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Emmanuel Iqbo, um, resident here. Uh, question to you, Mr. Uzi, uh, two things. One is about, you talk about uh, people voting without uh, the politicians or demanding the manifesto of the politicians. And uh, I'm wondering, isn't that something was, that was actually discussed back in uh, uh, 2000 or 2001, uh, that voters, uh, the politicians have to show or demonstrate the manifesto or even engage some kind of uh, a debate amongst each other so that give the voters an opportunity to understand what exactly uh, they plan to do, what the background is actually, their interests, and how they think they can solve some of the problems within the locale. That isn't happening within the governors. It's not happening in local government. It's not even happening on the presidential level. And so I don't understand how INEC allowed this to go on all these years. The second question is on the, uh, when you talk about people vote and come out and indicate who they voted for. Now, I vote here. I have no way of uh, putting anything in my pocket to show who or what I voted for, a Republican or a Democrat. So what mechanism do you have uh, in your system where people can vote, they're supposed to be secret, and they have some way of showing somebody outside that they actually voted for their party to collect money. Because if you can reduce that, then you reduce the, the ability of, uh, of uh, some trade by butter in, in the sense. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, for those two questions. Uh, do I, OK, gentleman right here will have the last opportunity. My name is Onka Okwa, and I'm a member of the uh, board of directors of Ab ABGA, one of the political parties. And it was just a coincidence that uh, I was visiting and uh, heard about this, and uh, decided to take the opportunity to uh, attend this. First of all, let me say this. Uh, I can say that INEC has done very, very well. I'm not saying it because you are here. I have watched, I've been in politics in Nigeria for over 40 something years. I went to American University here, went back. I'm also one of the founding fathers of APCA. So I am quite uh, involved in politics in Nigeria. And I've watched the progression of how the politics has been developing and uh, I was also the one that, uh, that forced the party to become involved in uh, a deep association with NDI, uh, IRI. I even arranged, we came here and visited the headquarters here. And in fact, a few months ago, I insisted, also as a member of the board of directors and a member of the Constitution Review Committee of the party. We went to IRI, held a meeting with them to engage them 
in assisting us in review of our party constitution. We also looked at. Oh, sorry. We also looked at uh, 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 our manifesto. So why I decided to say this? We are beginning to try to uh, become closely aligned. In other words, to develop our manifesto to be how we are going to practice our own politics in our own party. So what I've seen here is very good. I, I didn't even know, even though I'm a member of the party, I've not seen, we don't have uh, this kind of graph. I came very late, the, the, the things I saw here, this is really very good and it is very important if, if you can make this available to a lot of parties, it will be very, very helpful uh, for us uh, in the planning of this thing. So Richard, I think you were the one that uh, was talking when I came in. We, it would be very important for uh, you people to make this available to uh, political parties. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much uh, Mr. Okwa. Um, that's a lady on the other side, and please, I beg your indulgence to give her the opportunity to pose a question. Oh, sorry, it's the gentleman at the back. I didn't see when you raised your hand. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Ernest. I'm a doctoral student at George Mason University. Um, my, my question is, is to Uzi. Uh, please, can you talk about how you are mobilizing voters in Northeast Nigeria? Does your message also include safety for the voters? Thank you for that very direct question. I'll just uh, use the prerogative of the chair to add one last question from Mr. Uzi. Because the beauty of the PVT that was done in 2011 that Richard talked about was the collaboration between INEC and the citizen observers, especially on the issue of accreditation of voters. Uh, because when you're doing a quick count in a country as big as Nigeria, you need a lot of flexibility to be able to recruit, train, and deploy citizen observers. Uh, we now understand that there are new regulations in place that uh, require the citizen groups to submit the names of the observers six weeks in advance um, to be able to get accreditation. And if they are on a timeline to be able to train and deploy these observers, it's going to be practically impossible to have names six weeks in advance. Is this something that INEC is willing to consider on behalf of the citizen groups, especially given that these groups are well known, have a lot of credibility, and have proven over the years the ability to conduct a citizen observation, without which an exercise that happened very well in 2011 would definitely not happen in 2015. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chris. I, let me start with your question. I, I'm surprised that it was actually six weeks. I didn't realize it was that long. Um, yes, we are, you're required to send a comprehensive list in advance, and there's good reason for this. Um, a lot of the CSOs have actually been infiltrated by the politicians. We've taken uh, a close look at the composition of some CSOs, and you find out that those credible ones we've always dealt with and will continue to engage. But I think a lot of politicians have seen this synergy and collaboration between INEC and the CSOs. And they, as, as usual, want to hijack, want to take advantage of that. As I speak, there's, there's a prosecution that's bogged down by certain technical issues now of some fake observers, for example, in the uh, Anambra governorship election. They crossed over from somewhere in the southwest, did not go through the direct route, but went through a circuitous journey, went through a state where they had similar parties in gov government and tried to enter into a number from the east. They were coming from the west, but tried to enter a number from the east. Somehow they were apprehended. That case is, is being uh, prosecuted now. That's just one example. The instance of that, they had forged uh, observer cards. So we want the process to be transparent, right? But we also want it such that the, the activities of such unscrupulous people do not, do not take anything out of that association that we have with uh, the credible uh, groups who are doing a wonderful job. And um, the NBA and SWIFT count, we'd work closely with them in previous elections. And the, 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 the estimations also tally very much with what Richard's groups uh, were doing. 
I think, less than 2% margin of difference between an, uh, the elections in Ekiti and in Ondo before, before, before then. So we, 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 that validates our own position, and we're quite pleased about that. We certainly will continue to work. But I think the only challenge we've had with our engagements, I think in the situation with uh, the other day, we're talking about larger groups who want to churn out a lot more trained observers than uh, the CAP allows them to. And we've promised that those JDPC, for example, TMG, a few of those groups that have that network, and we know they are networks, and they cover the whole country, concessions will definitely be given to them to deploy as many as they can train and as many as they, the capacity can absorb. So that, that is that, sir. Emmanuel talks about non-issue campaigns. What is INEC doing about it? But it's, it's ideal. In fact, the National Conference just submitted this report. Part of his report was that uh, the debate issue should be institutionalized. I don't know what process that will take. I don't know whether it will actually see the light of day because uh, I understand the report has been sent to the National Assembly for debate. And the Electoral Act is in the process of being amended. And through the, uh, through the plaque and the Situation Room, we actually went for a public hearing about a month or two ago. Um, a month ago, the National Assembly, House of Reps, the Senate has passed its own bit, bit of the bill. The House of Representatives is in the process of passing its own. Theirs is more comprehensive. Theirs is much broader. I think this, while the Senate one had eight clauses to be amended, that was the House of Reps had 23 or 26. I can't remember exactly now. But the issue of debates, institutionalizing debates, making a statutory requirement also came in, but I don't think that has been accepted. By the time both houses meet, when they pass the respective versions and they meet to harmonize, I don't, I don't think, sadly, that will be part of it. Personally, I don't know whether INEC should be too directly involved in the debates. It's desirable and will assist and promote it as much as possible. But already, people accuse INEC of having too much to do. There's the talk of unbundling, that's the, the, the phrase that is often used, unbundling INEC, that let it concentrate on its core mandate of conducting elections. We are at the forefront, for example, of the creation of an election offenses tribunal so that, and, 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 and a commission, so that it takes away that responsibility, so that the core responsibility still remains intact. But we encourage all groups, we, 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 we do uh, support um, the Nigerian election debate group and one or two other groups that, have, uh, that are promoting such debates, so that issue-based campaigns now become the order of uh, the day. So, uh, say, what mechanism to indicate how people voted? What they do is take their camera phones or the, some of the politicians, it's uh, so prominent in Oshun, some of the politicians ask their supporters to take their cameras to the polling booth and snap their ballot paper when uh, they take. We encourage people to bring their cameras that they can film the process from a reasonable distance to show, part, as part of the transparency initiatives, that they can film the whole process, but not this idea of taking a photograph of your ballot paper. As I said when I was presenting, because they'll go around the corner and probably go and use it for other things and collect money, corrupting the process. Can I do anything to stop that? I'm afraid not. I can't stop people from bringing their cameras. In fact, to show transparency, to show that the proper things are being done, we wouldn't encourage people to take, if they have camera phones, take their camera phones to the station. But the question now is what use do you put a camera phone to? They didn't say that it's for them to take it so that they can say, no, I want to know how I voted. Of course you're there. You, you sat down there alone. You know how you voted. So what other use do you want to know if my ballot was counted? But you're not supposed to mark your ballot. You're not supposed to even know much about your ballot. It's part of the legal requirements that you cannot mark your ballot or make any distinguishing symbol on your ballot so you can recognize it. It should just blend with every other ballot as at the time of sorting out and counting. But they insisted and said it's their rights. It's, uh, no, it's still an ongoing debate, and I guess... Come the general elections, that might be uh, an issue subject to discussion, but we are opposed to it for this particular reason, because we don't see any additional benefit you get from photographing. Even though it's your vote, you know how you voted, so it doesn't matter. And you will not know whether your vote counted this way or that way, because it blends with all the others. Uh, okay, I don't think you asked a question. Thank you for the commendations. Um, ABGA is one of the parties that does have representation. The uh, number of governors from ABGA, and they've been very cooperative in the inter-party advisory Council. APGA is one of the bigger parties that have been very, very active in that regard, and they have their code of conduct. But my only, our only worry is that a lot of the parties who have subscribed to that code of conduct have not always lived up to it, but we'll still nudge them on to ensure it's, it's a voluntary code, 
but a lot of the things in the code are in the Electoral Act and amount to uh, 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 offenses with consequences of penalties. But if you can develop a code and you abide by it, you subscribe to it, so I think that ought to be sufficient without us bringing in issues of the uh, uh, breaches of the Electoral Act. Um, how do you mobilize voters in the Northeast? Tough one. <laughs> well, we've been doing that. My, my colleagues are in Adamawa as I speak. Adamawa is one of the states under emergency rule. Um, unfortunately, there are one or two communities we've not been able to go too near to. I tell people that there's a hierarchy of rights, and the right to life is, of course, the most important. Uh, you don't start to enjoy all the rights unless you have that right to life. And we will not do anything that will in any way jeopardize the rights of to life of our personnel, of the voters, of anybody. Um, but in most parts of the state, we've been doing a bit of work. Unfortunately, and understandably so, a lot of our international partners who've been supporting us, who supported us tremendously in Ekiti and Oshun, have drawn back a little bit, and understandably so, as I said, you know, the Adamoa state. We still think that um, in most places, a relative degree of normalcy is attainable and will be attained not only at the time of the Adamawa election, but at the time of the uh, general election. But we use our other means. Unfortunately, for example, I mentioned the, the Citizens Contact Center. In most of uh, uh, Borno and many parts of Yobe and Adamawa, you can't even get social media. The internet is not just, the gateway is not just there. In our offices, even we've had to resort to VSAT rather than the standard service providers. So there's a big challenge there, but we use other means and we're trying our best to use our other um, tools of engagement. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uzi. I, I see that uh, the conversation could be uh, extended uh, most exponentially because there's so much you can talk about with regards to Nigerian elections. Um, our two panelists will be available even during the second panel and beyond, so please feel free to come up to them and, and engage them in any conversations that you may want. Uh, let me just repeat for you the reference to the website um, where you can find all the data and all the information that uh, Richard provided. It's www.tmgtowards2015.org and we encourage you to really access this information, including the political party leaders from Nigeria. So please uh, join me in thanking our two panelists for a wonderful, informative session. Um, thank you very much to this panel. I think um, in the interest of time, we're going to um, skip the break if, unless there's protests from the crowd. There is coffee out there, um, but just in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll go straight to the next panel. Um, this was an excellent panel. When, and do, I do want to remind you to um, stay with us and join us after the session for uh, uh, some wine and hors d'oeuvres uh, as well. Um, why don't we have our second panel um, come straight up here. As they're doing that, um, I, I did want to say on, on this uh, question of ballot secrecy, I was in Sokoto in the last election and, and literally it was less subtle than taking a snapshot of, your, uh, of the ballot. It was going through a phalanx of party agents and, and showing the ballot all around and getting, getting high fives. Uh, and so, um, there's a big, big process there to voter education process. Okay. Listen, that was really a fabulous first panel, and I think uh, a lot of the data there and a lot of the themes we're going to explore a little more in depth in this one. Um, a, a couple being, you know, the, the question that was raised on issue-based uh, voting and how, how do you get to that? I mean, that's that's a huge challenge in Nigeria and, and elsewhere um, in Africa and, and beyond. Um, and and I, some of our panelists have done some excellent work on that. Uh, the other question that came up too at the very end was, um, 
you know, the modes of communication in different parts of the country. You have a lot of excitement about social media and platforms and so forth, but n they're not access equally accessible uh, across the country. And so there's variations that require different strategies for mobilization in, in the far north uh, to rural women versus young urban youth. There's going to be a whole, there has to be a whole collective of communication strategies to do that. Um, you know, on our original uh, invitation, we had Two-Face Idibia, who was supposed to join us. Unfortunately, yesterday, he let us know um, that his, his travel plans had changed. Uh, he's very interested in getting into uh, voter mobilization and lending his name, and, and hopefully drawing other celebrities within Nigeria um, to use their social capital to, to kind of get some of these uh, votes out here. So we're disappointed that he didn't come, but let me say that we, uh, I was saying we really have a, a, some rock stars here at the table uh, in terms of civil society leadership, some of the new uses of technology and social media um, uh, to, to get to, to reach voters. So we're, we really do have an all-star panel here, and, and we're delighted um, to have you all. Um, we have with us, uh, and we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll speak, we're not quite sitting in the order that we'll speak, but I'm going to start with Tunji Lardner, who is founder and executive director of the West African NGO network, Wangonet. Wangonet is really, one is, one is the early cutting edge kind of technology-based uh, organizations that's using data very much like, uh, I think there's a lot of synergies between uh, them and the, the TMG work that we've just seen in, in really presenting, collecting and presenting real hard data in ways that people can use and, and in ways that people can use to make their choices when they get to the, to the vote. And, and Tunji's gonna uh, tell us a little bit more uh, about that as well. Um, we also have Aisha Osori, uh, CEO of Nigerian Women Trust Fund. Uh, Aisha was with us in uh, January at our first session, and uh, uh, we, we liked her so much, we, we've asked her back. She's doing some phenomenal work in, in terms of uh, women motiv mobilization, but also how do we get women more engaged in the political process, both in, on issue-based, but also as candidates. Uh, and, and so she'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Idiyat Hassan is executive di director of CDD. Um, they've been doing work on voter education, uh, but also kind of examining why voters vote the way they do, what are effective messages, uh, how effective have been some of the anti-violence messaging. Um, again, uh, you know, in the last election, technically it was a very good one. 800 people uh, died in the aftermath of that election, 800 Nigerian citizens. Um, and, you know, w w was that preventable? This, it was kind of a crisis of, of expectations. And uh, I was in Sokoto at the time, uh, again, and, and you saw the jubilation of the, in the streets over the results that they saw at their local polling station and then at the, at, in the LGA and the state level. Uh, two days later, those jubilating crowds um, turned angry when they, when they learned of the national results. And, and, and so uh, we'll, we'll hear a bit from our panelists kind of how to effectively communicate and engage uh, people that young, young people listen to and that the leaders at the, at the local level as well. And then finally, Yemi Adamalekim, Executive Director for Enough is Enough, which is doing some great work on voter mobilization, but also on, on the role of the voter in protecting the vote and how do you engage them in that process. So Tunji, I'm gonna start with you. You're, you're welcome to come up here to speak or you can stay at the panel, whichever um, you're more comfortable. Yeah, well, we're, we're, you're welcome to, to do a little uh, song Sorry, for us, yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <coughs> well, thank you, this is my proverbial 15 seconds of fame, so I'm gonna <laughs> laugh it all up and enjoy it. Um, thanks for a very generous introduction. But basically, uh, we're here to talk about, um, the working title here obviously is Building an Informed an active electorate. I think the larger framing of the issue is really building um, <clears throat> excuse me, an informed and active citizenry. And that's at the core of some of the challenges that we have. Um, the reason why I think it's important to have this as a backdrop to our conversation because it provides some context. 
as to why what seems to be blitheringly obvious does not happen in Nigeria. There's always the implicit assumption that everything here that happens in Nigeria, that there's a legal and rational basis for it. That's not always the case. I said earlier on this morning at um, a previous uh, meeting that, um, as they say in relationships, it's uh, complicated. Uh, but Nigeria is even more so. It's uh, at once complex and complicated. So in a sense, with regard to Nigeria, it is complexicated. And it's interesting trying to figure out what part of it is complex as a system, which is what uh, some of the work that we've just seen before is doing. It's exposing it, bringing numbers to life and providing some kind of empirical contextual understanding of how the elections went in 2011. However, that is just on the empirical side, the scientific rational basis for trying to understand complex systems. On the complicated side is where we weigh in because that is where the challenge is about how do you get informed, enlightened, participatory uh, electorate. And you know, we're going to run through the gamut of you know, perhaps uh, cases, uh, case studies as to how those challenges are. Um, the Nigerians who live in Nigeria understand what I'm saying. Uh, so it's very difficult just listening in from the view from the outside in. But that view from the outside in is equally important because it provides us some kind of, uh, uh, should I say, empirical context, right? We, we are in the trenches. We are too close to the picture. So we tend not to be able to see the big thing. We see the complications and not fully appreciate the complexities. The view from the outside sees the uh, complexities, but do not fully appreciate the complications. So I'm hoping that before these uh, sessions are over, we'll be able to extract a middle ground in trying to explain it. So how do you get enlightened voters? How do you get uh, you know, engaged uh, voters? Um, even when we looked at the last presentation, it was clear, I think Robert mentioned something to the effect that Politicians and political parties have no incentive to engage the uh, electorate with regard to voter education and a sense of participatory engagement with, with, with elections proper. And the reason why that is so is because, you know, really, really, I mean, this is a, a fledgling democracy, what, maybe 15 years old from 1999. We've never had issues based elections. There's no incentive for politicians more or less to articulate a position and defend it, because they, that is not the basis for victory at the ballot box. And there's a mentality about that that has pervaded Nigerians. There are two things that happen as we look towards uh, 2015 and trying to engage younger voters who are coming on stream. There are two uh, psychological tendencies. One is a mindset that says, why am I voting? My votes don't count anyway. There's that pervasive sense that there's a disengagement between uh, the political process and potentially the benefits of a democratic process that delivers political goods and services. The other uh, tendency is just, um, I, I don't know whether it's just a gener generational alienation from politics, basically, right? But that's a deeper psychological uh, investigation. But that is the baseline of Nigeria. Uh, Robert said ever so politely, mentioned the uh, issue of trust. Trust is an integral element of uh, participatory politics. People have to trust the system and trust their leaders. And that is something that is uh, in extremely short supply in Nigeria. So the question now is how do you create a new constituency around participatory engagement with the hope and promise that at the end of that engagement, that A, whoever you choose to vote for will actually be your candidate and B, that that candidate will now um, deliver the social goods and services you daily need in terms of uh, democracy. In Nigeria, there was a language in 2000, well, I think it was, well, no, it was 1999, at the opt, uh, outset of this whole democratic experiment called the uh, democracy dividend. And it was supposed to be something that we got out of years of militarization, out of the coups and counter coups that it was going to usher in an epoch of um, political stability and unbridled growth. In a way, it has happened. It's not entirely gloom. I mean, the fact that Nigeria still remains together itself is a miracle, a miracle of perception, perhaps, but it's a miracle nonetheless. But these are dire times. Earlier on today, we we're doing the analysis of where Nigeria was. 
And um, you know, there are two narratives. One is the old narrative about Nigeria is getting to the edge of disaster every time. And so again, Nigeria is yet again at the crossroads. And you know, you roll your eyes and say, okay, so what's new now? Well, what's new now is that uh, there are other dimensions that have been added to it. One is, of course, the issue of insurgency up north, which really, at the heart of it, is fueled by poverty, ignorance, all the things that democracy should effectively be challenging if the, the uh, pl political platforms and the process of political engagement were based on the needs of the citizens. So it is clear that the political class, I sent a tweet a little while ago that um, uh, to win elections in Nigeria, voters are optional. <laughs> and that is so true. What we have to do is really change that narrative. And we're being perforced by force uh, um, charged with looking at the narrative all over again. There's a prevalent narrative of Nigeria, but there's still some good news in the actual electoral practice. Uh, it was very strange to hear uh, the chairperson of a political party openly praise uh, INEC. But they do deserve some, uh, some congratulatory um, <clears throat> words. We, I participated in the last three gubernatorial elections, Anambra, uh, Oshun, and Ekitis. There's a marginal improvement, but the challenge with INEC is really the economics of scale. It's not enough to, to have elections in three states, right? But you know, what happens when you're dealing with a much larger constituency? And those are the challenges we're having. Um, beneath that, again, is this issue of uh, not so much as uh, voter education as much as it is civic education. Some people are already saying the elections are not going to hold. Politicians have said that publicly, they've retracted. And this is all because there's a cynical game of power going on and power acquisition without any regard to what the consequences are. In the old um, uh, modeling, uh, the political elite had always managed to come together on the basis of some expedient uh, process. At the last time it was, um, I think, uh, the doctrine of necessity when uh, the incumbent president died and there were all kinds of political uh, jostling. And the constitution was clear. Your president is incapacitated for a particular period of time, your vice president steps in. But that was not the case of Nigeria. So we had a dying president somewhere in Saudi Arabia somewhere. And then this whole masquerade and you know, uh, pol uh, palace theatrics about keeping him alive and you know, all kinds of stuff. We, in, in spite of the fact that it was clear and then nobody would step up to defend the constitution, except, and then finally, when it became clear that it wasn't going to happen the way they wanted to, the, the, the Senate had what they call the doctrine of necessity. It's always this recourse to expedient um, solutions to exigent crises that has marked Nigeria's uh, challenges and its failures. The, 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 the inability to formalize the process, the inability to have a platform that is indeed legal, rational, means that people do not trust the system. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things that are evolving now that I, we think will make this somewhat different. As to how far different, I'm not, I'm not certain. But two things have happened that were not part of the initial equation. One is the insurgency up in the um, north, uh, eastern part of Nigeria. And that has put the fear of disintegration in the hearts of everybody because it is clear that there's something there that the state itself cannot fully respond to. The other thing that is somewhat neglected, but has also for the very first time generated some kind of a consensus of citizenship and civic engagement is the Chibok incident. I mean, yes, for a while it was trending, social media's famous, you know, um, uh, flavor of the month it was perhaps, but beneath that has been for the first time you see a regrouping of a certain kind of civic engagement, a new kind of citizenship emerging around an issue that was not political, that was not economic, but an issue that touched the hearts of everybody. It was, and it was, I mean, you cannot be more concerned than be concerned about your daughters and your children by extension. And the response of the government itself was if, ever, if you ever wanted proof about just how dislocated and disjointed and totally disconnected the ruling elites were from the so-called citizens, the Chibok uh, incident exposed it way beyond anybody's uh, expectations. It was very clear that if indeed there was a social contract 
And that's, that is uh, up for question. That social contract had been broken. And elsewhere, you know, in a more legal, rational space, the very idea of an incumbent president running on his record, such as it is now, would be absurd. But that is not the case in Nigeria. And the fact that also you have uh, another, um, should I say, um, I I'm not exactly how to, I'm trying to be very polite here now, but uh, <laughs> a poke in the eye of the citizens by the Jonathan campaign theme in appropriating the bring back our girls uh, hashtag to bring back good luck Jonathan in 2015. I mean, there's just something about it that is just surreal for me. So I, I can't even frame a response around it. But it's a very symbolic thing for us to understand because what it says essentially is that you, the people, do not really matter in this. I said it earlier on in a little tweet that uh, to win elections, the voters are incidental. On the flip side of that argument is actually the attitude of the voters themselves, right? And there are all kinds of reasons that can be adduced as to why there's general apathy. Yes, we can make the excuse of militarization, the fact that we've been under military rule, we haven't had the experience of actually unfolding democratic practices and principles. But there's something really terribly wrong with the Nigerian voter. You know, so it's not enough for us to blame the ruling elites. There's a sense that somehow, and it's, I don't want to go into any deep uh, socio-anthropological explanation as to why this can be, but there's something about the Nigerian voter that just makes him think that somehow this process that is before you is really not important enough for you to invest your time to, uh, and commitment to it. We, we seem to have a very um, short attention span because they think the whole democratic experience is basically showing up for elections and you vote and that's it. I, I, they, they, that's why I was saying earlier on that it's com uh, complexicated. The, the complicated part of it is a very Nigerian phenomenon. I don't think it, it plays out elsewhere. But there's some, certain parts of it that are just very, you know, ordinary, you know, garden variety African states and citizenship issues. But in this particular instance, we're again uh, at the precipice and, and we're not certain if the, the political elite consensus that has kept Nigeria from tipping totally over will hold. But somehow we're optimistic that it will because that's how Nigeria has always been. So there are two things I want to leave you with before. Uh, I, 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 think, I, I think we have to look at it differently and I'm hoping that as much input from the view outside in as much as it is that we can provide the view from the inside out, we provide some kind of a balance. The, uh, the issue of the uh, insurgency is important because it's a threat to the existential, uh, existence, uh, existential life of Nigeria. But there's something that has also happened uh, with the Chibok uh, episode that has started a different kind of civic engagement. Because it is not directly political per se, we might not be able to uh, put a, some kind of an normative value as to it, but there's something that is happening, and perhaps we're beginning to see the emergence of a new type of Nigerian citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Tunji. I do want to say one of, one of the positive things was, I mean, to, to his credit, President Jonathan did speak out against that, that campaign slogan as soon as it, it, it came out. And that, I mean, well, I mean, that politics, it, politics is ugly, but I mean, it, that's going to happen again and again, I'm sure, in the election pr process. One of the things, and we tried to get our po political leaders when they were here, it's incumbent on the political leadership to speak out when members of their party engage in that kind of um, rhetoric. And, and, you know, this actually was an instance where, where they did. So just... But then, you know, the side <laughs> conversation tonight, it was only when the Washington Post wrote an editorial about it. There's only when the Washington Post wrote an editorial about it that prompted the response from the executive. Okay, well, I don't know the, the, the cause and effect, or was it a, a correlation or a causality, but um, at any rate. Um, so, uh, I mean, but that is an instance where you can speak out. Um, let's see, who was I going to go to next? Uh, no, uh, Aisha was next um, to speak about um, yeah, engagement of women. Uh, in the political process and in the electoral process. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here to speak about women and um, their involvement in elections. My points are just going to cover three main areas. First of all, I'll talk about what some of the challenges and opportunities are in terms of women as voters and women as candidates. And then I'll talk about some of the work that we've done at the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund to address some of the opportunities and challenges that we've seen and that we can do something about. And then I'll just end with my thoughts on how we can move forward and what the opportunities are also for collaborative effort across civil society and with some of the other key stakeholders. Now, I'm not even sure to start as voters or candidates. Let me, let me start with myself since I'm a voter first. I've never been a candidate. Now, some of the challenges that um, we've seen that women face as voters, I think some of them um, Uzi mentioned in the beginning. Now, women are the primary caretakers. Um, elections are, in Nigeria, an event. They don't happen easily like they do in some other countries where you can sort of decide, I want to vote now and stroll down to your polling unit and vote and go home. This is, is an event. Your, 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 your whole entire day or Saturday, in fact, for three weeks, successive Saturdays will be taken from you because you want to vote. It takes a lot out of women, especially if they're the only caretakers, they don't have nannies and they have children, and they have to drag these children to what is potentially dangerous areas to go and vote. So you find that although lots of women in there are some states from the 2011 register, sort of Oyo, Oshun, where women are actually the majority of registered voters. We're not sure yet, because we don't have that data from INEC, whether that actually translates into women being the predominant voters. So while we know they register, we don't know if they actually vote. And we do know also from the 2011 elections, when we compare the number of people who are accredited to the number of people who voted, that is always usually a discrepancy. There's usually fewer numbers of people who actually voted. So maybe this is where some of the women and the men are falling apart, uh, falling um, by the wayside. The second issue in terms of women and voting is from our experience, and this is on the field talking to women, predominantly women in the lower class, I will confess as somebody middle class that I never voted until 2011, which is way above the age of 18, if anybody could guess that. Uh, but my point is, people, the elite usually don't vote, and that's the truth. We don't vote, we don't get involved in politics in any way. Um, we think that that's better left for those people who have nothing better to do, and then we complain because things don't work. But we've deliberately left that sector for them to manipulate. So back to women as voters. So you find that the women that we've been interviewing and talking to, the lower class women who actually do register and usually line up for hours and vote, they don't see the link between their vote and the state of their lives. So you speak to a woman and you ask her about, you know, what are her worries, what are her issues, whether it's the fact that there's no potable water, whether it's the fact that her, her children who she struggles to put through school don't have jobs. She doesn't see the link between her going out to vote and somebody in office being able to solve that problem. So it, it's, it's really, there's not enough data and information to show why do people vote. There are some who argue that the voter's registration card or the PVC, as we, the permanent voter's card, as we're going to start seeing in 2011, has some political economic value that people buy these cards. And so maybe this is why some people feel the need to register and go through that process, not necessarily because they plan to vote or they think their votes will count, but because they know that somebody will offer them money for that card, the same way somebody will offer them money for their votes. So it's, again, part of the stomach infrastructure. So they don't see the vote as a way of changing their lives, so bringing some sort of meaning into how they decide who to vote for, but just a process where they can gain something in the short term. So those for us are the key challenges. Now as candidates, there are lots of issues with the Nigerian political process, I'm not going to delve into all of them, but one of the key things is that not enough women are running. That's the bottom line for various reasons, whether it's the fact that it's expensive, it's violent, um, it's not particularly welcoming, there's lots of patriarchal and social and cultural pushback to women as leaders. So many women just abdicate. So for example, although we have um, a 2015 goal to have 30% women in the National Assembly by 2015, right now we're at seven, which is one of the lowest in Africa where the average is actually 22.2%, and Nigeria is at 7%. And without some sort of affirmative action quota in our constitution, it's quite unlikely that in 2015 we will make that number. Um, from the data that we have from INEC from 2011 elections, out of 10,000 plus 
candidates, so aspirants who wanted to contest, less than 1,000 were women. That shows that less than 10%. So where is the 30% coming from? If we don't even have up to 30 40% of women running, where do we expect to get 30% representation in National Assembly? So one of the biggest challenges for women as candidates is actually getting women to want to contest. We're just not seeing enough women. So now back to what the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund has been doing, is doing, um, apart from trying to change the narrative. Now, one of the big things we think we see an opportunity in is changing the narrative around women in politics, changing the narrative around women in leadership. Why would a woman want to run? Why would she be a good leader? Why would she be invested in her community? And why should other people support her as well? Because that's also something that's missing in terms of the support for women in politics. There is no natural constituency for women as voters, not from the women themselves and not from the men. There's also no support from the parties because we see that even though some of the major parties have within their constitution some sort of acknowledgement that they want and will support more women, they actually don't put that into practice. Um, so what we did was come up with a video um, earlier this year, first half of the year, it's called The New Dawn. It's very short. I know everybody's, everybody knows that Nigeria is famous for Nollywood amongst other things. So we thought, how can we blend our love for stories and visuals instead of just creating another dry documentary with women and men talking about the importance of women in politics? How do we create a story and a narrative that would appeal to people? And so we had this short 20 minute film called The New Dawn. And we had some of the Nollywood um, heavyweight sort of Jocker Silva and um, Kate Henshaw feature in it very briefly. And we're very happy to say that it was really well received. We launched it to lots of applause. The Federal Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development is actually using it as their primary tool as they go around the six geopolitical zones talking to women about participating and taking part in elections, um, engaging INEC on their continuous voter registration and making sure that they pick up their PVCs. Um, we also understand from Kate Henshaw, who is on Twitter, for those who are on Twitter as well, who's declared recently that she's going to run for, uh, to represent her people of Cross River in the National Assembly, and we're very proud. And she says, this all stemmed from being part of the process of producing this video and launching the video. So what we're finding is that what we've learned works in other parts of the world, which is that women need the affirmation of being asked. They like to be told you can do that. They like to be, you know, they want somebody to tell them, you should run, you can do this. We are beginning to use that narrative at home as well and saying who are the women who are doing great things um, publicly and unknown and how can we encourage them to run. So that's part of what we're working on. We've also started talking to young girls in groups, um, targeting specifically women who are just young girls finishing secondary school who in another year or two would be eligible to vote and talking to them about why they should vote and why their dreams and aspirations for themselves are tied to the political process. And what we're finding in the two states we've been in already, which is Cross River and FCT, is that these girls were extremely happy to be talked to about this subject. It was something that they'd never heard about, even the ones who had been to formal school. Nobody ever talked to them about the political process and explained to them why, as citizens, they need to register, they need to be involved, and why their votes should count. It was also the opportunity to start making the link to them that, look, Voting is your way of contributing and having a say in what is going on. So we have this tag called Vote Now My Power, which is pigeon for my vote is my power, a vote is my voice. And so we have stickers and t-shirts and we engage these girls and what we're trying to do is we put them through this program where we're saying if you go on, if you register, you're 18 and above, you register, if you can get 10 more people to register, it qualifies you to come to another program in another six weeks where we'll teach you how to make beads or where we'll teach you how. So we're, we're also selling them a skill. So it's not enough to just say go, because people, there's high unemployment in Nigeria. So how, what's the hook for us to get these people engaged? So that's how we've been running these um, workshops and they seem really quite successful and we're hoping to replicate them in another six, seven um, states with the support of INEC. So those are the kind of things that we're doing. Now in terms of the opportunities for collaboration, we're looking at the numbers from the continuous voter registration process and the collection of PVCs. Now, I'm not sure how many people know, but we've been doing this in Nigeria in three phases. So we've done phase one and phase two, and now we're getting ready for phase three. 
Um, some of the states where we're working in have already had their own, um, this process, and we're finding that the numbers are a bit disturbing, to be honest. If people cannot register, sorry, if people cannot vote without their PVCs, then the numbers that we're looking at in terms of people's collections, so for example, the FCT where I live, the collection rate was only 44%. Um, yet that process for collecting um, PVCs has closed, even though technically it's still open if they can find INEC offices. So we're finding that where we need collaboration is for civil societies in different parts of the country who are working on similar projects, sharing what their information is so that we can sort of double up uh, and have visibility on what's going on. And we can make sure that our, our messages are, are on target. Also, another worrying thing is about the CVR, continuous voter registration. The numbers are very, very low. So, for example, while FCT, while we're worrying about the fact that in the Federal Capital Territory, we only have 44% collection rate from PVCs, we're finding that in terms of new registrants, it's like 4.4%, which is basically a percentage of the 2011 registered database. Very, very low. And it's the same thing everywhere. A place like Jigawa that had 87% collection rate of PVCs, you still see only 18%. So we're wondering what's causing this discrepancy, particularly because people seemed excited about wanting to register. So is this a function of INEX processes not being able to meet the demands? And how will this play out in 2015 when the results come out? And as I think a previous speaker had pointed out, they don't see the results they want. And they suddenly, the people who couldn't get their PVCs and who couldn't vote suddenly feel cheated and decide that maybe their vote would have made a difference then. So for me, this is where we have enough time in the next five, four, five months to work hard to make sure that every Nigerian who wants to vote and is eligible to vote gets a chance to register and to collect their PVC. So for me, that's one of the opportunities where we can work together. Also, in terms of narratives and what voters need to know, I don't think... We, we focus too much on, well, we focus predominantly, not too much, we, there's still a lot of work to do, but we seem to focus predominantly on the technical issues of voter education. So for example, you know, it's time to pick up your PVC, this is where to go, um, have you picked it up, you have X, Y days to go. But some of the technical stuff, for example, like do you know that if they've declared results in your polling unit and so one X candidate wins, that doesn't mean that he's going, he or she's going to win everywhere else. Are you aware that to be president of the country, it takes two thirds of the, you know, so teaching them this fundamental things that will help us stem the violence that comes as a reaction of disappointment when the candidate they, that they want doesn't win. So for me, those are again, other opportunities for us to partner together across civil society and with INEC and the political parties who all have a stake to make sure that the elections are peaceful. So I think those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, obviously, mentoring is a very big issue, especially for young girls. How can we get into universities and work with student union governments to say, look, let's start encouraging young girls to run for office while they're in school. Let them start learning the ropes, building their confidence. These are all gaps that we have in our, in our system that we can do something about. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aisha. Um, let's turn to Idayat um, Hassan from uh, Center for Democracy and Development, okay. talking about anti-violence messaging. Uh, no, talking about okay. issue based policy. Okay, all right. Uh, the kind of voter education programming that we've always run in Nigeria has focused more on procedures for elections than the right of citizens during election, as of course. Um, exemplified in the laws guiding elections, then of course strategies for protecting mandates. And this has, had, has got tremendous effect, positive on the outcomes of election, particularly when you look at the 2011 general elections, which for the first time was not just an improvement by Heineck, but it's said to have reflected the will of the people. And this trend is actually, um, it's been replicated in all the staggered elections we've had in the recent past in terms of AKT and Oshun election, the will of the people is actually reflected. But there, there is still lots to be desired, in particular when we start questioning the issue that what informs voters' choice? Why do people vote the way they do? What factors influence citizens' choice? And has this led to the consolidation of democracy itself? then is the current civil society approach to voter education sufficient 
to engender inclusive governance and a developmental state after might free and fair credible elections. Of course, there are lots of explanations by academics and practitioners on what informs our voters' choice or why do citizens vote the way they do. In our own context, it's of course driven by ethnic ties, religious ties, now the new evolving the north-south divide, and of course clientism as exemplified in vote buying. But this clientism or vote buying has taken another dimension entirely, which is actually worrisome um, with the Yekiti and the Oshun election, where we saw the doctrine or the, uh, a new sociology evolved in terms of stomach infrastructure. And the stomach infrastructure concept is basically inducement with either cooked rice, uncooked rice, vegetable oil, and it took another dimension in, in, in Oshun election where kerosene was added to it. Kerosene is a foil. So you have the foil, you don't just have rice, but you have the foil with which to actually cook this rice. Then when, when, you, when you look at this critically, then you ask, what is, why have voters voting? Are they voting in terms of people-oriented programs? or they are voting in terms of financial inducement. Then this brings a critical question into context. What is the democratic worth of voters? And what is the quality of their ballot of votes? Particularly in our own context, where the way through which you participate in the governance process, the only way known to Nigeria is cast your ballot every four years. That is our concept of participation in this whole governance process. But this participation in itself, has it led to the delivery of public goods and services by a petty trader trading with $20 who has stood under the scorching sun for eight hours to exercise his or her own mandate? If this is so, and of course, no political party is blameless of this stomach infrastructure doctrine. And it's not that it's a new thing in our own context. It's just because it's taken an hydra headed dimension from what was actually previously obtainable. That is why it calls for caution. Then, then how do we shift this? How do we make the ballot much more worthwhile? Particularly from the basis that I started what are voter education programming, which CDD does, and most of the civil society organization has been doing in, uh, for years now. And this election offers us an opportunity to move towards issue-based politics. Beyond issue-based politics, issue-based politics alongside promoting democratic accountability. Because what we have in context is transactional electioneering versus issue-based politics. So how do we make the shift? And lots of discussion has evolved today. The issue of our political party is not supposed to have manifestos has come up. Of course, the electioneering process itself, and even for you to register as a political party, you have to draw your objectives from chapter two of our constitution, which is all about social democracy. And in Nigeria is not one of issues to discuss upon at this moment in time. We have the issue of accountability up there. We have the issue of security as, a, as an important factor. So how do we shift this election towards this as against transactional politics? And of course it's our uh, electioneering. And of course it has its own advantage if we are able to shift. One, is the fact that it will be able to, it will assist in stemming violent conflict. Because the kind of, the kind of discourse that is ongoing is much more confrontational amongst the gladiators, amongst the political gladiators. Then again, it gives us an opportunity to hold our elector, elected officials accountable post-election period. But how do we make this shift? 
And that is why the issue of voter education comes in. The issue of groups coming to disaggregate these messages in terms of what do this political party A stands for? What do political party B stands for? And beyond voting on this, I'm not saying it's going to be very easy coming from our recent past, but it's something that should actually be started. And how do you hold them accountable post election period, which calls for a broadened civic education beyond what we have, of course. And Jennifer made um, uh, a very big issue on the issue of, um, what did they call it, uh, violence-free programming. This is also a very big issue, but Aisha has already touched on it. And it's something that we have noticed that remains a very huge challenge in our voter education project. When we preach voter education anti-violence, we talk more in terms of shun violence. We do not go to the basis. We do not go to the laws. We do not go to the prevalent or context-specific factors in our environment to tell people that you need to third majority or to third of the state to win the presidential election. You need so, so, so percentage of your, of your state to win. The popularity of a candidate in a particular community or a state does not necessarily translate into elections. And this is why we are coming into context-specific voter programming, uh, education programming for some states that are already identified as hotspots, and also getting people to sign on to non-violence messaging, as well as voter education, taking into consideration what the election uh, electoral laws is all about in terms of in terms of uh, stemming violent conflicts. But beyond that also, the issue of community consensus or community conspiracy is a very big issue in Nigeria. You have the all election is a process, but most of the time the election becomes challenge from the voter registration point, where you have communities coming together to conspire, to either favor a, can a candidate or somebody. It's a politics of attrition. This is our son, this is our daughter, and this is part of the challenge that uh, INEC faces most of the time. How do we move community conspiracy or community, um, uh, I don't like to use community conspiracy. It's, it's not too nice a word to use, but in the real sense, uh, that is community consensus to proactively engage so that it plays positive roles in promoting participatory democracy in these 2015 elections. And whose responsibility is it to do voter education? These are critical points because the issue of voter education has always been left at the doorstep of civil society organizations and INEC. But what has become obvious is that when you promote issue-based politics, you also be driving the political parties to campaign based on what their party programs and manifestos are. And of course, the businesses has also got to be involved in this because we have seen best practice from all over the world where the businesses have been actively involved in, 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 in electioneering periods. Uh, particularly voter education. And the, con the concept of participation, of course, is something that we really have to redefine beyond voting on election day to actually holding accountable our elected officials, particularly if we want the, the, dem uh, the dividend of democracy, that democratic consolidation in, in the sense of delivery of public goods and services. Now, what will define how our democracy is, of course, a very big issue. There are several issues that is going to de define our democracy post-election. First and foremost, it is going to be the quality of citizenship that has been coming up since we started this discussion today. Then, of course, the quality of the ballot itself. What can this ballot get you? And, of course, the quality of participation, which might still be the quality of uh, citizenship will be all inclusive in determining the quality of governance. We get after might uh, a free, fair, and credible 2015 elections. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Idiot. Um, Yemi, you have the wrap up role of protecting the vote. Okay. 
Good evening, everyone. It's been a long day, so hopefully this will be short and sweet. Um, next slide. So a bit of context. I think it's a perfect segue from where I, a diet left off, and really very simply, that the quality of our elections is a function of the quality of the participants in the process, both as citizens and as institutions. Um, and this slide, yeah, basically just showing power of the people to, to determine. Next one. Um, and our own engagement as an organization around elections is framed around um, a campaign that we've tagged RSVP. And RSVP is taken from the popular acronym um, in terms of responding to an invitation, but has a colloquial um, adaptation in Nigeria also for <laughs> uh, responding to an invitation. And it's our um, rice and stew very plenty, basically at a party that there's a lot of food. But for us, it's just very simply that these are the four main groups of activities that citizens need to engage in um, to participate effectively in elections, especially focused on young people. Um, register to participate in the process. Select credible candidates. Having scrutinized the options before you. Vote on election day. And then protect your vote, not only on election day, but the four-year cycle in between, which is um, just so that it moves from being an event to a, a process. Next slide. Some context, the numbers. So these are from 2011. 73.5 million people in the voters register. It's now being pruned down, sort of cleaned up, um, duplicate voters and things of that nature. But 2011, these were the numbers. 18 to 35 year olds, supposedly 62.4%. Presidential elections across parties, 38 million people participated and voted. Um, using project, Nigeria hasn't had a census since 2006, so using sort of growth figures and counting for a variety of things, it is estimated that over 10 million people have turned 18 since 2011. Numbers are a bit dubious, but even if we say it's 5 million, the idea is the numbers of those who became new voters in 2011 compared to those who actually participated in voting for president, uh, in the presidential elections speaks a lot. And in a real sense, nobody's really talking to that demographic. Next slide. Um, for EIE as an organization, we've leveraged a lot on celebrity power. Unfortunately, one of our SVP ambassadors, um, Two-Face, couldn't make it, but he's one of the people we've leveraged on really trying to use influencers to use their voice around the campaign and encourage especially young people to participate in the process. Next. Um, Omotola is one of them. It was Time 100, I think, last year. And I, these are snapshots from her social media, um, social media platform, sorry. So on Facebook, she has about 1.7 million likes. On Twitter, she has about half a million followers. And the idea simply is this. Um, we leverage on influencers and their voice. So Nollywood is extremely important. Music is extremely important to this demographic. How can, we, how can they use their voice to sort of make participating in this process um, interesting, funky, I and mean, very similar to the sort of MTV Rock, rock the Vote kind of, kind of campaign? It's worked, I think, relatively well, and we've had some issues with some um, artists declaring openly for a candidate which can uh, throw out the nonpartisan side of it. But for the most part, I think, I think it sends the message. And this is an example of what we've done with that. If you play the video. Next slide and then the video. So. I will register, I will select carefully, I will vote wisely, I will protect my votes. I'll be two-faced Dibia. You say, go out there, register, select, vote, protect. To Baba say so. Sorry, so next slide. So basically a 30 second PSA um, that we've tried to, we used quite a bit in 2011, just trying to get it started now for, for the 2015 elections. And some of the issues, I think just, um, I think a lot of the issues have been raised, I won't bore you with repeating that, but I think this for me is extremely important in terms of trying to get people engaged and excited about this process. So in 2011, registration was done across the country at the same time. So you had the benefit of national buzz, national attention, everybody was talking about it no matter where you are. But this year, INEC in its infinite wisdom, has divided it into three phases. So the first phase happened in May. And basically what that means is, so now we're talking about elections, people are getting into the process, you suddenly wake up today in Kebi State or Benue State and you decide you want to vote next year. You can't. There's, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, phase two um, happened August 22nd to 25th. 
a lot of report back about um, uh, inadequate processes, inadequate machines. People were disenfranchised, people were frustrated. INEC has extended it, so it's happening again this week, though in fewer locations, so you have to get there. And in phase three, which has, I think, three of the largest states with the um, largest number of voters, dates for that has, has, have still not been announced. Next. And I think another part tied to that also is INEC's language of engagement. Even though there are some PSAs and flyers who are done in sort of major languages, primar INEC's primarily, I think from our perspective, language of engagement is English. Um, in a country with over 250 languages, dialects, grossly inadequate. And I think a classic, a good example of that is INEX Voter uh, Citizen Contact Center, which operates solely in English. Um, we're trying to work with Ford Foundation to actually add an IVR system where people can call in and, and engage in other languages. But that, for me, is, for us, is a major issue in terms of engagement. Next slide. Now, finally, so RSVP, I think all the others have touched really on, on S and V and just focusing last on sort of uh, protection. I think we started the panel with looking at what was done with PVT and um, citizen observer, trained citizen observers. As an organization, we really want to encourage citizen observation because at the end of the day, um, I think the PVT does that in terms of choosing people in the local community, which is fantastic. But if you are, it is your polling unit and your ability to really, I mean, so if you're an accredited observer, what you can do is observe. You note down what happened, you note down the irregularity or whatever might be and you report it, but you can't get involved. You can't see anything because you're there to observe. But as a citizen observer, if it's my polling unit, I can actually more or less sort of step in because it's, it's in my collective interest if things in my polling unit happen as it should be. And a classic example was from a Doe elections, I believe, two years ago. And in a number of polling units where there were issues with the um, discrepancies with the voter register, actually citizens just refused to vote until it had been corrected. And they could do that because it was their polling unit. So really changing the narrative, I mean, maybe amplifying the narrative that yes, it's, it's great to have accredited observers, they have their role and they have their place, but really encouraging citizens to take it upon themselves to be the observers and not only observe from a position of um, documenting what happened to the point about being an anecdotal or post factor, but being engaged enough to be willing to take a step or being active enough to do something to actually ensure that um, the elections go according as they should. So um, a month before the 2011 elections, EIE actually developed a mobile application um, that was meant to turn every, any citizen into an um, election observer. Next slide. Um, so from your mobile phone, basically, you told them what type of election it was, if voting and accreditation was done on time, votes were collated, was there violence, did they announce results, and what the results were. Next slide. Um, showed up sort of in an Excel sheet, dumped data like that, and then showed up, next slide, as a map like that. And the idea really, um, we're trying to upgrade it for the 2015 election since it was done very crudely, but really just provide a tool that's easy to use, um, user interface very simply. This definitely was not, people found it a bit complicated to use also, just that we didn't have time to do that. But really something that's fun and engaging that people really would want to report what it is that they're seeing. The information is made public. In a sense, you can do parallel vote counting in real time. Um, some of the feedback we've gotten, oh, what if people uh, lied and put in information because they're not um, well trained, you can't vouch for who they are. As we found out with social media over the years, social media tends to self-correct itself. Um, for people at a polling unit to collude, I would have to have a meeting with three people or everybody and say, okay, if we're using this app, all of us are going to lie. But if it's open to anybody and anybody can use it, the chances that people will be honest um, are, are, are quite high. I'm not quite sure what my next slide is, but next slide. Oh yeah, and just a reminder that 164 days now, our girls are still not back. Thank you. Thank you all very much um, uh, for, for those presentations and that kind of wealth of issues as well that's come up in that. I think we'll, we'll take about 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, you know, I, I have a question on the whole civic engagement generally. I mean, and I, you know, every American kid knows kind of the three branches of government, the separation of the state, you know, George Washington and the cherry tree and, and all of that. Uh, is, is civic education at all a part of the common curriculum uh, in, in, in states? And is, is there an effort to work through the school system and through the educational system on, on, on some of those issues? 
Um, that would be maybe one question, because you've all touched on this, this notion of, uh, you know, kind of the fundamentals of, you know, that you kind of need to imbue, and that takes a very long time um, to do that. Um, should we open up for a few questions, and um, we'll take three at, or four at a time, and then come back to the panel. We're going to start with Tony Carroll over here, who's an associate of the program. Um, Tony Carroll, I'm a senior associate here in the Africa program. And, um, you know, one thing that really wasn't mentioned was the, uh, uh, the nomination and primary process. You know, it seems to me that women are, are perhaps crowded out in that process. Um, it seems to me that it's the greatest arena for power politics to hold. And, and I'm wondering if there's been any more sort of transparency or is it this, still this opaque process? Because, you know, it's the old adage of garbage in, garbage out. And if the process is as credible as your organizations are, clearly, the fact is if you're working with a very, very imperfect selection process, then you're really, you know, not having optimal impact, notwithstanding your great efforts to do so. Um, let's work our way over. So, yes. Um, my question or comment really you goes to Aisha. Name. My name is Grace Ioma. Um, you talked about women challenges in becoming candidates. Well, I have often wondered whether you, you know, the fundamental thing of, it's also connected to ind indigenship. Um, women generally move from their own locality to become wives and We've had issues, for instance, with federal character and where they should belong, and a Supreme Court justice candidate was almost denied the position. I can go on and on about all of those kinds of issues, but it's so fundamental. I wonder if, I don't know what the electoral law says about that, because I haven't looked at it, um, but if a woman cannot even be sure where she can contest I mean, it's so fundamental. You've lived in a place, you have your children, you, you're, you're virtually a citizen of, or a resident of that place, and you're denied that fundamental uh, right to contest from that locality. They'll use it against you even if the law uh, permitted it. So I think uh, it's a fundamental thing. And then there is a brain... I don't know if it's uh, something about women generally not liking women uh, contesting. You must look into that. Because the share numbers should permit more women. The share numbers of women and how active they are in politics should permit more women. And I know what my friend Florence Itagiwa suffers, you know, just for being out there and acting as if she was a man. You know, so it is, it is something, you have your work cut out, but I think these issues are so fundamental, I don't know where to begin with them. You take it from indigenship, you take it from, you know, where do you belong? As they say, go back to your father's whatever. Anyway, it, it is a problem. Thank you. Uh, Britt Minchel, Renaissance Institute. Uh, first of all, for Mr. Lardner, uh, I would like to say that don't be too cross with your people. We in the United States had one four-term president, and we tried to get our first president to be a king that we got just rid of. So uh, that's human behavior, I'm afraid. Uh, but for Ms. Osari, oh, you mentioned the, the fact of t touching on losing. And I think you, you guys are doing a stellar job to set these elections up. And with all of that, there should be a lot of expectations of persons going to the poll and getting their way. So I, I would like to hear an emphasis on, on teaching people how to lose, because half of the candidates lose. We do it in America. I don't know how we do it, but we do, manage to do it. Thank you. And uh, Nee. Thank you very much. Nee Akwete is my name. Um, I. Tunji, I, I was startled about uh, what you said about voters. Frankly, I thought you were blaming them a little too much. And so it seems to me the engagement question, the, the, um, 
persuading voters to vote. The thing that surprised me was I actually think that in Ghana, voters are very much awake and they will tell you thumb power. They can't wait for elections to come to punish you if you are not performing. And I'm surprised that that is not the case uh, uh, in Nigeria. But it seems to me that the responsibility is not just civil society and the political parties. It seems to me you've left out the media. The media are businesses, but they have special privileges because their job is supposed to watch the politicians and tell the people. Um, and, and Aisha, um, about women as candidates versus uh, voters. I was wondering, you know, I lived in Nigeria and started the Soros Foundation, and a number of women came to me and said, give us money and train people to run, uh, women to run. And I thought we should start with training women voters so they will choose the right candidates, even if those candidates are men. And they got mad at me and said I wasn't supportive of them, so I, I want your opinion. I want your support, actually. Thank you. Thanks. Kind of goes back to the primary issue a little bit as well. Um, why don't we take that set? Um, Tunji, do you want to start with the civic education, or if anyone, if anyone wants to take that on? Okay, everyone has a minute. First question, okay. sorry, the first question you asked had to do with civic education, uh, perhaps embedded in the school curriculum. I think that's what you're alluding to. There's a challenge there because over the last, say, 10 years, it's been excised. Uh, there's no civic, there used to be actually uh, a subject called civics that dealt with this, each issue of citizenship and all. But even more uh, dangerous is, uh, is the excision of history. So you do not have, even at the O levels, uh, the obligation to study history of Nigeria. Uh, so these are, there are huge gaps in the, uh, um, in the educational system. And, and that is really some of the challenges we're facing. Uh, ten, 10 years down the road when eight-year-olds become uh, voters, they have no contextual understanding of their own country. And I'm not sure if it was a deliberate oversight or it was, uh, it was an oversight or it was deliberate, but those are some of the challenges we have to do, address, address the curriculum itself. The issue of uh, nomination in the primary is very, very important. Uh, the Nigerian uh, expression is uh, internal democracy, and that's, that's the way it is framed within political parties itself. But again, there's the uh, irony of uh, uh, political parties and politicians. I, I, I wager that you can't have democracy without Democrats. And so it, it is very clear that's a, a challenge. INEC itself, unfortunately, is also burdened with the responsibility of enforcing the rules, right? But in a society where there's great impunity and there's no respect for the rule of law, we keep going back to the fundamental building blocks of building a legal rational process for running a democratic country. And those are some of the underlying challenges. You know, you can't answer one without the other. The issue of um, participation of women, I'll leave to uh, my sister here. But I think it was a very important point you made about teaching politicians how to lose elections. Unfortunately, again, it's, it's a zero-sum game for everybody, right? Because there's so much tied into the acquisition of political power, uh, especially at the center. And until, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why that has happened. One of the more clear-eyed uh, ex explanation has to do with the uh, fiscal regime of the country. If you don't pay taxes, you don't have skin in the game. And so there are all kinds of, you know, really interesting socioeconomic reasons why people feel uh, disengaged from the political process. Uh, one, one way of getting their attention is to uh, reform the tax uh, infrastructure and make sure people pay taxes, right? Um, then the voter education thing is not left for civil society, media, uh, but again, you know, we keep going back to that. Uh, the, the, the media itself, uh, you know, I used to be a journalist. I don't know if you can ever be a, a former journalist, but maybe a lapsed journalist. I fell off the wagon. There's just a sense of how the, that whole thing has lost its uh, relevance as, uh, I think, who was it? It was Burke that talked about the, the fourth estate of the realm. You don't have that anymore. You don't have that engagement. You don't have the agenda setting responsibilities. Right now, there are all kinds of, you know, if within the Nigeria Twitter space, uh, uh, somebody made a recording of a, a pastor offering bribes to a journalist to screw a story. These things are part of it. The larger thing, and um, perhaps as a nod to my friend there, but my concerns about Nigeria, you know what they say, you always scroll to the ones you love. 
The larger thing here is when a country has lost its moral compass, and I'm not saying these things lightly. They're, they're, these are the underlining issues that I keep coming back to, right? And it is basically us as Nigerians who are held responsible. I think we are all responsible in varying degrees for what has happened. Thanks, Tunji. Um, uh, Aisha, do you want to talk about the yes. indigenship um, <coughs> and the other question? I, I definitely want to touch on the issue of primaries and women. Without a doubt, going past the primaries is actually one of the hardest things that women do. And as a fund, we've actually discussed where our support for women come more strategically. Should it be before the primaries or after? Um, the bottom line is th there's no easy answer. Uh, the truth is it is still very opaque and women don't start early. It's all, all tied to women's position within the parties. Many women are part of parties in a very fluid way. So they're there to wear the uniform, to dance, to serve, to just make the, the whole event colorful. But very rarely do they actually hold membership cards. So even when they want to run, it's like they're starting from scratch. So they might have been affiliated with the party for years, but they're not members in the sense that they can take decisions, influence decisions. The same thing when you look at the party hierarchy, the National Working Committee, the BOT, where the decisions are taken, there are no women. The token uh, position for women is women leader, which has no budget, has no position. Even at meetings, she has to drag her own chair and put it down there because they, they usually forget about her. So all that is tied to how women go past the primaries. They don't understand the delegate system because in most of the parties, it's not direct primaries where every member can vote because the parties don't know who their members are. They can't, no party can tell you in Nigeria, I have XYZ numbers, XYZ are women, and XYZ are men. So it's, it's, the whole system is rigged for opacity, so you don't know what is going on. Delegates are supposedly hired on the day of conventions, deliberately. So all these things make it very hard for women to compete. And even when they do and succeed, God help us, we hear that sometimes the list changes before it gets to INEC. So you have all those issues. So a woman has actually struggled, beaten the system, won the primaries. By the time the list gets to INEC, her name's been taken off, and somebody else's name is there. And that's despite the harassment, despite the beatings, and their stories documented. So it is extremely hard, and you have to even question the sanity of people who want to run. But, but God bless them, and, we, and we, we continue to encourage them, but it's not easy. If we had um, independent candidacy, which is something some of us at the civil society have been pressing for, then we might actually see a more level playing field, because women and men, good men and women who don't want to have to deal with the, internal, the lack of internal party democracy within the parties now have an option and can say, I'll run as an independent candidate. But we don't even have that. So it's actually critical. Um, I want to answer the question about indigenship and residence. You're right. There's nothing in the Electoral Act that prevents any man or woman who lives anywhere. So a man from Oshogbo who's lived in Sokoto for 20 years ideally can run. Nothing in the law prevents him or her from doing so. But the people and the culture prevent them. And you're right, yes, that's one of the reasons why women don't run. Or they don't make the decision to run on time because they're wondering, am I from Sokoto? Am I running from Katsina? Should I be? You know, where do I? I mean, God help you if you marry in one place, live in another place. And, you know, so you could technically claim three places, but which one would you choose? So again, yes, you're right. It is a big issue, but until we change our constitution, which is some of the things we've been fighting for for the last three, four years, Again, there's no progress. So you begin to see, as Tunji said, it's a zero-sum game. It's almost like where it's a chicken and an egg, it's circular. Everything is rigged to make it hard for good people to run. How do we get good people into the National Assembly to make the changes that we want? How do we get voters to vote in the right people who will make the changes that we want? Everything is tied together. So you made a valid point, but the truth is there's no answer until people like me and you get into the National Assembly and change the Constitution or vote for people regardless of where they're from, or stop asking people, where are you from? Mm -hmm. It's one thing I extremely dislike. Can Nigerians stop asking people, where are you from? Mm -hmm. You just ask me, where do I live? Because I, I might know it's true. Why do you want to know where I'm from? It's all part of trying to exclude me from a place. I live here. This is where I'm from. Let me choose where I'm from. Don't ask me, where was your father from? Where was your mother from? Here and now, this is who I am, and this is where I live, and this is where I want to be from. But we also perpetrate this injustice by constantly asking each other, where are you from? Um, women voting for women. The truth is, you know, I don't believe women are their own worst enemies. I think most of the pain that I've suffered in life is from men, not at women. 
most of the most supportive people in my life have been women, so I don't buy into women are their own worst enemy, and I never say it. On the other hand, I don't believe that women will naturally vote for women. Just the same way I don't think men will naturally vote for men. Maybe it seems that they do, but they're the ones who run. And you also can't exclude our socialization. If all our lives we've been told to suspect women, and the truth is I've done some research on this. I looked at fairy tales from Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa, which are the main languages, and I'm telling you, each of the fairy tales keep putting women in a bad light. You can't trust women. You can't give women your secrets. You can't do this. You can't do that. Why would anybody want to vote for a woman? If you've lived all your life hearing this type of thing, even women don't want to vote for women. So until you change the narrative around women in leadership, you change the narrative around women's role in society, we're not going to automatically assume that women will just wake up and vote for women. They will need to see that the women are different from the men. You just pointed to your friend Itagiwa who acts like a man. That's not a good thing. <laughs> in Nigeria, we want women to act like women, to be, act different from the men who are responsible largely for the problems that we have in Nigeria. So the truth is, I too wouldn't vote for a woman who's acting like a man. I would want to vote for a woman who's acting like a woman. Um, so I think that's another thing that we need to be talking about. Losing, I won't talk about losing, but yes, we need to learn to be good losers. I'm very bad at losing, so I never play any games. I don't want to play Scrabble, I don't want to play Monopoly, because I hate losing. So it may, maybe it's a Nigerian thing, but we definitely need to learn how to, 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 to lose gracefully. But I think that comes from educating the electorate about how it works. So they just know that I voted, they just know that they counted the votes. Like, I was deeply disappointed as well when I voted in 2011 for the very first time in my life. And I went home with the polling result units, and I sat in front of the TV waiting in my own ideal world to hear the results released polling unit by polling unit, because I wanted to be able to clarify that my vote hadn't changed, or the, the results in my polling unit hadn't changed between the time it was announced and the time it got to INEC. But INEC didn't give me that satisfaction. And so, technically, I could feel cheated as well. So what we've been trying to encourage INEC to do is put a lot more transparency around the collation of results so that people know, even if it's months after, let us have this sort of verification exercise. We keep explaining to them that the lack of trust that Richard mentioned is deep and as transparent as possible. If we can make that process, it helps everybody. Um, and then finally, training female voters before training female candidates, I totally agree. Um, I also think that we can do more in our, in our, in, in our civic education to help speed up this process. We've tried to engage with the Board of Education. They're not interested, it's very bureaucratic. They don't want to get involved. They don't know if you're bringing an agenda that's different from the ruling party's agenda, which you know, civil servants, are, they say they have no party, but basically they need to toe the line of the ruling party. So all those things add up to, but I agree with you. We need to train proper citizens, the quality of citizens that I have mentioned, and it should start in school. I'm not American, but I know about the cherry tree. Why can't we use, no, it's true, I know about I can't tell a lie, and I've known that for ages from watching Sesame Street. I've known that as a child that in America, George Washington said, I cannot tell a lie. But I don't know that kind of rhetoric about anybody in Nigeria. Why are we not using our movies, our Nollywood? Why is enough is enough not using the stars more productively other than just making sexy ads? Can they make some information, some educative material for our children as well, so that they too know about their political history? I think those are all the things, and that's what makes me actually excited to be in Nigeria, because there's so much we haven't tried. There's so much we haven't done. And maybe when we start doing those things, we'll start seeing the change that we want. Just a comment about uh, just a comment about uh, female participation in politics. For instance, I've taken part in uh, the process of selection. One was just some months ago, and uh, my observation. I was just thinking about it now that uh, we're having this discussion. Is you really don't have uh, many women coming forward. For instance, I took part in selection of. Uh, uh, the uh, governorship, uh, gubernatorial candidates in Anambra, uh, only one female came forward. Uh, there are others a few years ago, virtually no female. Now, uh, as I was just thinking, is it then possible that one way 
to really solve this problem will be to uh, go, into the, go to the National Assembly and uh, maybe pass a law that, yes, informative, exactly, that there must be so soon number of women and so on. Because first of all, for people to come forward, uh, you have to have money to run for an election. And I think men control the money there. So women are not in a position, first of all, when they come, you have to assess, there are certain things you have to look at. The ability to- Thank you, we are, we are just about at time. I think, I think your point is well taken. Um, the uh, gentleman here will make it a very quick, and I think that was more in the, in the way of a comment. Yeah, I, I, my question is to, I think to um, Aisha and also Mrs. Han, uh, there seems to be a general theme here that is this an election or a selection process? And you've all articulated that the stomach uh, uh, infrastructure, the kerosene, and the cooked food, and, and so on, and people don't understand in why they vote for, and when they lose, they don't know why they lose. Now, isn't it possible then that if you can transfer all this activity you're doing into the media to push the, uh, the, the need to have a debate so that when somebody loses an election, they know why? See, a winner here would say because they, he supports a gun law or he is anti-immigration. Those are some of the key factors why somebody would lose. And they'll say, well, I guess I didn't have enough people uh, to support my cause. But in the election in Nigeria, it's not about the cause because people don't know why they vote for. They're giving some money and so on. So isn't there a way to get the media from what you guys are doing to help educate uh, voters and say, we must have a debate so we know when we go there uh, to vote, we know why we're voting for and what we're voting for Mr. A or, or Mr. B. I thought that will help. So when somebody loses, they say, well, they don't go to fight in the Supreme Court for another 18 months. They just go home and say, well, I guess I'll try again next time. I don't know if you, Idiot, do you want to say one last word on that? Oh, just to, just an FYI, our next session will be kind of on the role of the media in this. And, um, we'll, okay, and, okay, Idiot, and, and then I'll give Yemi the last. Quickly put, that's the intervention of the Center for Democracy and Development for these 2015 elections, is to promote issue-based politics by bringing the political actors and the candidates to actually hold elections around topical issues like security, accountability, and of course, social democracy in Nigeria. And the media in that? And of course, we are doing this alongside the media because, of course, our first uh, a part of it is also to break down their manifesto as part of and programs as part of voter education program. Then to work with media so that they can put most of this discussion in limelight, both as opinion editorial, both as reports, newspaper reports, and also it will form uh, what we will use to measure the performance of any incoming government. So we are building a democratic accountability platform which will be named after anybody that wins the presidential elections or and in some select state. And their programs, maybe their seven point agenda, 10 point agenda, eight point agenda, they shall be measured against it openly by citizens, media, and there will be continuous feedback mechanism where the reports on this will actually be placed in limelight. So it's no longer about opposition being against us, but it's about them seeing their performance as are judged by the citizenry. Last word. Um, just about the debate, I think to Aisha's point, it's all connected. So um, Mr. Uzi mentioned earlier, um, Nigerian Election Debate Group, the platform exists. Enough is Enough has hosted five debates over the last four years. The can major candidates don't show up because at, at the, the end, end of the day, day, they realize it has nothing to do with who votes for them. So the fact that you, the platform exists, I mean, I think two weeks ago, um, King's College, one of the oldest um, secondary schools, high schools in the country, their old boys, very influential people, hosted a debate, asked the two leading political parties to come and talk about their education policies. None of the chairmen showed up. Somebody sent some director, another one sent an assistant. So until people, until there is a direct result, 
from people voting, then they will sit up. It's not the debate that will make them sit up. It's sort of the back, I mean, it's sort of back, it, it all connected. I guess back, just back to that point, it's all connected. So the platform does exist, but until I realize that my result has something to do with what I say and what I plan to do, it's irrelevant. Listen, we're, we're at time, and uh, the stomach infrastructure awaits, awaits us there. <laughs> uh, I want to say <laughs> thanks so much to our panelists. Uh, I mean, this has really been uh, a great two panels, in fact. A couple of the things that strike me is, one, the importance of data and hard, you know, kind of hard fact. And, um, you know, the stuff that uh, TMG has done, the stuff that some of these organizations have done, um, there are other groups out there. One of the big challenges is, is pulling that all together into a f structure and a framework that can mesh with each other so that you kind of have the master, master pool of information that you can use for some of these things. Um, the other thing is this question of a changed narrative, or I think Tunji was hinting that, you know, kind of a renewed social compact. And, you know, that's a very, very big challenge. And, you know, we have to think about what is the first step to do that. You can say, well, politicians need to do this and politicians need to do that. What is it that we need to do to make the politicians do that? What is, what is the incentive that gets them um, thinking that way? And related to that, and this was, is very striking to me, the fact that uh, civics and history have been struck from the Nigerian curriculum. I mean, if you want to talk about building a social compact, building a sense of common purpose, you know, the educational system is one of the first places to do that. Um, you, know, you, you know, you don't have to pledge allegiance or, or, or that kind of thing, but you do need to know the basics of, of where you're coming from, why you relate to one another as Nigerians. Um, and have that sense of, of, of common history and then common purpose as well. So, um, you know, I know that you are all trying to do that in your, in your different ways, um, but it's, it strikes me that it needs to be more systematically embedded um, into the national fabric. And the challenges of today in Nigeria, well, and in much of Africa, make that, that that's, you know, that embedding of civic education uh, from the very get-go uh, strike me as all the more important going forward. Anyway, uh, our next session, as I said, is going to be probably sometime in early November, late October, well, probably no early November, uh, on, on this issue of the media, um, uh, media independence, but also get some media folks here analyzing some of the political dynamics going on. Um, I want to thank you all for um, staying with us and uh, really thank our excellent panel. We're going to be spending some time at the State Department at AID with the One Campaign tomorrow for kind of um, uh, smaller roundtable groups. And, um, you know, we, we hope that you found this productive, and I know uh, we have, and I hope also that we'll be able to stay in touch with, with all of you um, uh, through the election process and beyond. Um, so please join me in um, thanking our panelists here today.